Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Chillapalooza, number 15 here on Double Feature. Wow, my name is Eric. I'm with Michael. Michael, we've made it to Saw. We've we... finally made it to Saw. If it's Double Feature, Chillapalooza, number 15, uh, it must be Saw. To it. Goddamn Saw jokes. <laughs> these are, I really hope that people are watching these at home. Let me yeah. tell you a couple things about Saw. Okay. Saw is available the entire fucking set. This is such a perfect way to do this. So we're going to end up talking a lot about the production of Saw. Uh-huh. It's, um, as we've gone through these different Killapaloozas, we've discussed how it's kind of a hodgepodge of all these different people, accidents, these movies show up years and years apart. Lamps get thrown into the mix. Right. Saw is perfect production-wise in that it changes hands the way a franchise might, really the way a franchise should yep. to, to really make things interesting. Yep. But man, does it carry a, a single solid story? And, uh, well, we'll get into all that stuff. But if you didn't watch the Saw movies, as we uh, urged you last time, this is a great place to start yeah, on Killapalooza. It is. Uh, you can get these all on iTunes, every single one. And um, you can get most of them, the uncut version or the director's sure. cut. We did all the uncut versions. Right, which is why we're doing an uncut show. We are doing an uncut <laughs> Now, the reason we're doing an uncut show is because I don't want to edit what I'm sure will be a seven-hour episode right. of Double Feature. No, you know what? It's show number 15, and it's the Saw show, and we can joke about you know the, the uncut movies or whatever, but uh, let's just give people a straight raw. We're gonna, I'm, I've been so excited to talk to you about these movies. You and I are probably going to have a ridiculously organic conversation yeah. about how we feel about the Saw films. Yep. And exciting things that you or I have picked up knowledge wise over the last couple of years. <laughs> so, this show will be brought to you uh, basically edit free, which is always hard in our studio here because it's noisy as fuck all. But um, the other thing is, uh, we've been working on stuff on the double feature site. Mm hmm. Now, we're going to spoil the movies today. Yep. And there's chapters you could, in theory, if you haven't seen some of the Saw movies, you could skip between the different movies. If you have seen the Saw movies or you just want to learn more about them, there's uh, the kind of knowledge base around Saw seems to be scattered all throughout the internet, on DVD jackets, through production notes. Um, I really had to do a lot of digging to figure out, especially when we start to get to you know the music stuff. So what I thought would be a great idea is if we compiled all of the Saw information and put it on the Double Feature website. So I'm talking, you know, music stuff, but also links to, like, the iTunes stuff, for instance, yeah. right? Say you want to get the movies in HD whenever they're available. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you want to rent them, or maybe you want the covers. You want the white cover of every single one. I'm going to put that on DoubleFeatureShow.com. To be honest with you, this show goes up pretty soon. I'm not even really sure how I'm going to do this. But uh, when we switched over to the new site and we put all this crazy stuff up, we didn't really do that for the Killapaloozas. Right. There's a different <laughs> number every... You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's hard. It doesn't fit the template of two films. So this is the week that I figure that out, and I'm going to make a giant Saw database somehow on our site where you can get lots of stuff. So uh, I guess go see how that turned out. Yeah. Um, Doublefeatureshow.com. Now there's another thing. Uh, that we usually talk about on the Kill Blueses, or we've been talking about lately. Sure. And that's uh, donations for yeah, our show. Yeah, right. So we got a little project that we're, um, we're kind of working on. We've been having, uh, would you call it server trouble throughout server the- Server trouble. How would you describe the, let's talk about the canon of our server issues okay. over the years. Um, well, we run out of space. We have to pay a lot of money. And despite- handling both of those situations it still manages to piss everybody off yeah it's uh it's pretty much terrible <laughs> it's a total mess yeah so here's the here's the solution i've come up with and this is incredibly out of the box 
And I'm really hoping uh, Podmanity can help us out with this because it's a it's a weird uh, it's a weird thing that we're gonna do. We um, so here's how a server works, really quick. Uh, it's just a computer somewhere out in some server farm somewhere where some company, GoDaddy, for instance, has hundreds of millions of these things, and your website sits on it as a bunch of files. And if the host is unreliable, or they charge a lot of money, or bandwidth, or blah blah blah. It uh, you know, it takes a lot of money, time, resources, effort to host that stuff, and a lot of times it goes down, or it doesn't go up at the right time, or these are the types of issues we're having, and we get hit with this big bill every once in a while, and, and we try and get donations throughout the year, but you know that's hard to do, and then you just get hit with this bill all at once. So we're gonna make our own server, and uh, we're gonna make it out of an Apple TV. And Apple TV, I thought would be uh, one. It would be kind of poetically fitting uh-huh. because it's it's going to be the most subtle and nuanced thing that happens poetically on the entire <laughs> show. Uh, saw show, but it's what we watch all our movies on. It costs at what a hundred bucks or something, mm-hmm. and you know it, it takes a lot of work to make it into a server. It's definitely not something that's supported out of the box. But if you kind of mangle the software on it, you can get it to work. So I thought that would be awesome to host our website on. And we have, for all the broken stuff we have around the studio, one thing we have is a great dedicated internet line. So we're going to make our own goddamn server and put a, an end to these uh, server problems once and for all. We're also going to make it solar powered, which is crazy, I know. But if the power goes out in here, which I mean, this place is in Uptown and that's, yep. you know, totally well, likely. Well, it's in Chicago and the yeah. power just sometimes, di- it just dies. Yeah, it's fine. So uh, we're going to make it so that it will run off a backup battery that will be powered by the sun. This is fucking ridiculous. Perfect plan. I, I, I see no flaw here. So this is going to cost just over 400 bucks to do. And uh, you and I, I don't know if you were aware of this. But you and I are going to put in two hundred dollars. Okay, so that is done. That's that, out of the way. We're going to go. Right. We're going to go halvesies with Fan Podman fucking here. Fucking fantastic! So we You're are welcome. Com- <laughs> we're uh, we're counting on the listeners to do the other half of that. It's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Um, since we've already put in our portion of it, I've started working on as much of it as we can. And uh, we're keeping everybody up to date on the Facebook page and on Twitter as to what's going on there. Awesome. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. So let's start with the first Saw movie. Oh, okay. So we're doing Saw on the show today. Yeah, it's um, true. And I, I say that with this level of its wonder and confusion. Uh-huh. Because when we started the Killapaloozas sure. way, way back... Right. It was based on this premise of slasher films, and about four Killapaloozas in, it became glaringly apparent that Saw was the next good one. Yeah. <laughs> then we yeah, right. did 11. Yeah. 11 more. <laughs> yep. And now we're doing Saw, because we it had to wait. somewhere around Child's Play, where we right. kind of went, oh, Saw's a big thing we well, should probably do. It was coming out currently. Yeah. Well, that was the other problem, And we right? had to wait for them all to come out, and they constantly said, this is the final one, this is the final one. Yep. Two years from now will be the last one. So that's what sets Saw apart from every other Killapalooza, is that it's fucking new, mm-hmm. and they're sequential. So Saw, the film, comes out in 2004, and then there's a Saw film released subsequently every Halloween yeah. for the next six years. Yeah, that's crazy to me. That's absolutely crazy. It's one of the things, again, production-wise, that when we start to get into the later films, we'll see how they actually take advantage of that. Right. It's pretty amazing. So when the first Saw came out, we didn't have a franchise yet. Nope. We had a Saw film. We had an indie film. We had a we had a Dark City opening to the movie Cube is basically <laughs> where we started. Um, not to mention the other obvious, you know, the seven influences right. and, and a lot of things like that that came out of it. Um, the, the movie deals with a lot of the kind of raw humanity, you know, stripping away society, uh, a movie like the thing or predators, right? you know, that is just about human interaction and how people play together in a survival kind of environment. Well, it basically, yeah. I mean, it, it brings everybody down to a, a visceral, almost caveman level. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. What do you do if you and a stranger are chained in a bathroom sure. with some saws? Sure, right. 
Yeah, that uh, that kind of interplay between human beings, uh, seeing, I guess, how we react in an environment where, you know, you push people to their limits. If somebody has to make a quick decision on, you know, instinct, right? Live or die, what are you going to do? The choice is yours. Yeah, you have 60 seconds. And you put them under that pressure. Do people crack? You know, that that idea, I guess, of finding out who someone is when they're they're staring down the barrel sure. of a gun. Uh, that is, at its heart, I think, what Saw as a franchise is about. And certainly that first Saw oh, movie. Yeah. You know, but the, the part that's really intriguing to me is the initial kind of the trust issues you get, the not necessarily just finding out who someone really is um, by putting them in these scenarios. That's all well and good, but, I mean, your characters are whoever you tell me your characters are. Yeah, so exactly. finding out who they really are, I, you know, whatever. I'm just going to listen to whatever you tell me. But seeing how the different people interact with each other. Right. So, for instance, you have these initial kind of trust issues uh, when they're exchanging the tape. Yeah. Our two characters here, the Doctor and, of course, Adam. Yeah, played by uh, Lee Winnell, who yeah, wrote right. pretty much every fucking Saw movie. Yeah, well, who wrote the, you know, he was the one of the co-creators. Yeah, of him the and franchise. James Wan, who, uh, who also did Dead Silence and Insidious. Yeah, and these guys, um, I mean, you know, Lee did, he wrote the first three Saw films, straight out wrote them. And then he's got the, the same production uh, credit the other co-creator does sure. on uh, the rest of the stuff. So he's in the scene, he's in the majority of the film where you have two characters and, you know, they first get the tape. And so those initial trust issues, those initial kind of, you know, you wake up in this environment where you're scared and it does tell you a lot about a person, how they react to the next human being they see. Sure. Do they cry for help? Or do they, do they assume they... they're to blame? Right, right. You know, and that happens a lot of times throughout the franchise. That's a fun thing to look for is... You wake up and there's another person chained up across from you. And, you know, maybe a fourth, a fifth of the time, the person goes, what the fuck are you doing to me? Yeah. You know, they just immediately assume a lot of times they know the other person. Sure. Um, but you have those kind of trust issues, the stuff we were dealing with mm -hmm. in Cube. Uh, that mystery of the other strangers and whether or not, not only do you trust them, but I guess, are you willing to cooperate with them or are they your combatant? So then, you know, he doesn't pass the saw to the other guy, uh, steals the photo for the competitive edge. Right. That's what I really like to start seeing is, you know, there comes a point where you, you, you maybe you trust the other guy or you don't, but you start to strategize. You've gotten over the panic. You're hanging out in this uh, dingy bathroom long enough to almost reach boredom. And you kind of go, okay, so where is, where, how am I getting out of here at the expense of the other individual? Right, well, the other big keystone with, with Saw, with the first Saw film, is that both characters hear the other one's tape. Yeah, that's true. You have Adam, who is in this room with uh, Dr. Gordon, mm -hmm. and Adam hears that Dr. Gordon's tape says, you have to kill Adam. Sure. I yeah. mean, then immediately he knows, okay, well... At some point, we're going to be pitted against each other. Right. If if he follows this riddle, like if he plays into the game, sure, he's going to be a threat to me. Sure. Well, you're given no background about these two. These two guys don't know each other, and so they they don't know what each other are about. So you know, our killer has this. Well, he's got a lot of advantages because he's chained up two poor fucking men in the uh, the bathroom. But um, one of the big advantages is that now having this blank slate, he can taint their perspective by playing on their fear, their, sure. their fear of one another. By basically saying, you know, these two guys might have, they're in the same situation. They might have banded together to solve, you know, this, uh, this thing they're in. Kind of like, I know you'd, uh, you've seen the movie uh, Exam, yeah. right? That's yeah. what that's called. It's on Netflix. It's one of those things, you know, you kind of know if someone has Netflix because they ask you about a, a movie. A movie-like exam. Yeah, and you go, oh, well, yeah, that was that thing that just showed up on Netflix. But it's a movie where a bunch of people are kind of competing, but they, it's got a lot sure. of similar themes. Yeah. Right? But it, in Saw, to kind of contrast it to that, there is, okay, we've got this blank slate. 
we're going to start with, um, you know, maybe we'll work together. That's one possible thing we could do. But also now our killer has pitted us against each other. So you know that even if that wasn't that other guy's original intention, it's now in the back of his mind. Right. And is he having that same trust issue with you? It's saying more about uh, about playing on somebody's immediate fears than it is, you know, are they a good person or a bad person? Would they try and, you know, win at the expense of other people or something like that? I want to uh, just totally make a, a weird transition here and talk about the ridiculous editing in uh, yeah. in this movie. Well, it's not just this the, movie. No, it's <laughs> no. You're right. It's really not. The um, we have these uh, edits that start in the very beginning. I think um, a lot of what you think about when you think the, the packaging of the Saw movies, aside from the uh, the torture aspect of it mm-hmm. and the every Halloween aspect of it and the empire that it kind of became. You think about the look and the feel, the, I don't want to call it a lack of tact or subtlety because that sounds mean. Right. But you know what I mean? They're yeah. very, they're abrasive and they're bold in their, uh, their choices yeah. of what to well, do visually yeah, or editing wise. It's um it's one editor we see through most of the franchise who we'll get to later because he comes up in a pretty big way too. But they have these uh these kind of tape sped or 45 degree shutter or just really quick MTV kind of edits. Uh the the reason that that actually kind of warms my heart a little bit is because it gives us an excuse to do that crazy fast cage edit time lapse thing yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So for as much as those edits come up and it's just like seeing a bad transition in a movie where I go, wow, that was a bold and interesting editing choice. Sometimes you get these payoffs that are just incredible. So in that particular scene, in the cage scene towards the beginning, it's uh, Charlie Clouser does the music Uh for another great production note, the entire fucking franchise. Same composer for the entire weird Same composer for the entire franchise. You get one of his fucking great guitar numbers. It's just, it's a, it's a Charlie Clauser music video at that point. So, um, tell me a little bit about who this guy is. Well, I mean, he's a, he's a composer, but that was, that's, I think that's post his Nine Inch Nails career. It certainly is. Yeah. Um, since, uh, since doing a bunch of stuff with, uh, Nine Inch Nails, he um that was a good era, right? So that was mid nineties. Right. That's, so uh, that was around the fragile. Yeah. It's I, I guess his albums were the downward spiral and the fragile. Wow. He was Those in good uh, ones. yeah, some some heavy hitters. He was in uh Trent's live band, but also he did a lot of the remix stuff and the engineering stuff uh-huh. for the various Halos, the um the stuff that fit in between and came right. afterwards, the remix albums, all of that. And then, you know, score-wise, he did some of the other uh, Wand stuff, but he did Resident Evil Mm -hmm. Extinction as well. I think that's what the third Resident Evil movie. Uh, He's gone on to have a a really great career as far as, you know, all of these different things that he's been able to score, even outside of the seven fucking (laughs) Saw movies, just so many of them. So this comes well before the Saw remixes that we'll eventually get to. But the score in this is a lot more industrial rock band kind of score. It's, um, you know, one of the the scores I've always really liked was, it's strange talking about him on the third Resident Evil. The first Resident Evil movie, Marilyn Manson did the score for it. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of just, uh, you know, very grinding. I think Manson talked about, you know, wanting to make something that was kind of repetitious, felt like zombies, mechanical. And, you know, later when the Saw movies would start coming out, we have kind of a a similar sound in that industrial rock sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, Clauser's worked on Manson stuff before, too. So, you know, there are there are those kind of tie ins there. That whole industrial perfect circle, Pussifer kind of thing. Uh, He worked with a lot of those bands. But, you know, he does the score for this movie. You have that rock band feel. You have the the um, re-triggered drums, that kind of relentlessness to it. The score came out, there's a large portion of it that's on the original soundtrack for mm-hmm. the movie. I'm guessing one of which is the uh, the uh, standard Saw reveal montage song. 
Yes. That this, comes, uh, comes yeah, at the end of every right, right. film. The Zep song. Yeah, there is. So this didn't get a full on score release, but that's one of the tracks you can get. The soundtrack is, I mean, these songs are lined up right next to the likes of, you know, Fear Factory and Frontline Assembly and a lot of bands you might associate this kind of uh, this kind of sound with, mm-hmm. even though those bands don't appear in the movie, you know, at all. So uh, we should talk about James Wan, too, because we oh, kind of yeah. glossed over that a little bit. But uh, he's the director of the movie, and you'd mentioned uh, a couple other things that he had done. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did uh, Dead Silence, which is that movie about ventriloquist dummies, and then sure. more recently he did Insidious. Right. Um, which he created uh, Billy the Puppet, as yeah. he's known, the the right. saw the kind of saw dummy that yeah. shows up in a lot of these films. Shows up apparently in a lot of his other films too. Yep, everyone makes kind of a little cameo. So. Uh, to go on and to work on Dead Silence sort of makes sense. Sure. But he works with um, uh, Adam... Um, Lee Winnell. Yeah, Lee Winnell all the time on different projects. And Charlie Clouser, uh-huh. I guess, on different projects. So, you know, the three of them will kind of come together with probably a lot more of the, the crew from these movies. And I think his strength is really as a producer rather than sure. a director. Well, he's not necessarily stellar at getting performances out of people who we know are good actors. Sure, that's true. We know Carrie Elwes is a pretty decent actor. Right. If only because of the last Saw film. Yeah. Um, And then Danny Glover and our friend Michael Emerson. We're aware that these are powerhouse performers in the right circumstance, but this is James Wan's first movie directing. Right. Uh, He did the Saw short right before this. Yeah, yeah. I think that what Saw really represents, not necessarily entirely from a directorial standpoint, but as a Kickstarter for a franchise, is that Saw is a brilliant idea that's just flawed enough that an expanse will would be progressive. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah, I definitely it, agree. It's that. a positive thing to make a sequel because you go, here's your idea, here's what you did wrong. But all we have to do is, you know, clean it up around the edges. And now we have a great sequel and a great sequel and a great sequel. And as long as we pay attention to the movies we're making, we can have a really solid thing going here. And that's what James Wan really created with Saw. Sure. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. That's when I think of him as a producer. That's exactly why. I don't even know if I'd say it's wrong so much. I kind of feel like the... The first Saw movie, maybe it's because we were just talking about the Charlie uh, Clauser stuff, but it seems like the gritty, you know, first album. Sure. It's the, uh, the, almost the demo tape, I guess the short then Uh would have been the, the demo tape before this, but it's a lot of just raw elements coming together. The influences are more obvious now than they'll ever be anywhere else. And uh, it's made on the cheap. It's made very indie before they knew they had this this gigantic thing on their hands. But even to look at the acting, I mean, that's where you see that. That's where you see the the production win out over the directing. Right. We have um, a lot of icons, stuff like the Shawnee Smith at Bear Trap. Yeah. And then with the acting, we have, yeah, there's two people from <laughs> Lost in this. It's not just Michael Emerson, but it's uh, it's the guy who played Miles oh, as yeah. well. Um, who is Detective Singh in yeah. here. Funny just seeing him play that detective role. Yeah, I want to talk about Michael Emerson a little bit because I don't know that he'll ever show up on anything we do ever again. But he is, for as little of his stuff as I've seen, one of my favorite actors. Yeah. Only because I'm familiar with the, the vast uh, majority of his work, which was in the show Lost. Michael Emerson has, first of all, just starting off on that show, one of the best story arcs I felt was ever on the show, mm-hmm. um, that that Henry Gale story arc. It was uh, maybe six episodes or something that spanned over, but it was one of my favorite periods in Lost. And I won't talk about it, really, because what, right. what's the point of talking about Lost on this uh, this episode of the show? But just really great in that, and he only got better as the series went out. Um, the, uh, the Emmy stick that you yeah. and I used to joke about, you know, when he would start beating people with that fucking stick, J- just a lot of the greatest moments of that show were either contained Michael Emerson's character or, uh, were completely due to his performance. Even as the show entered some questionable territory, 
the fact that Michael Emerson was on it made people tune into it because of how fucking good he is. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny that Saw, I mean, from a direction standpoint, it does a couple of these things and Lost did the same thing where, so Lost is a very enigmatic show. Mm-hmm. Saw is trying to be pretty enigmatic. It has all of these twists and reveals. They do that thing people do with Michael Emerson where he talks off camera and as an audience, we're all supposed to pretend we don't all know it's him. Right. Or, uh, you know, the, it's even worse, the, um, the later shot of his eye when he's hanging yeah. out in the closet. The two most recognizable things about Michael Emerson is crazy looking eyes and the way he speaks. Yeah, it's true. And they always do that thing where he's the secret guy and you're not supposed to know, but he's clearly Michael Emerson. But I think that that's okay in Saw because even though he is secretive and he's supposed to be the surprise hidden bad guy, uh, right. Zep, he's actually the red herring. He's yeah. a fucking utility character for right. what in all fucking honesty and anybody can take me to task for this and fuck you if you disagree <laughs> sure, sure. so hard that you have double feature show at gmail.com you explain to me why i'm wrong when jigsaw gets up at the end of the fucking movie that is one of the most mind-blowing moments it now, is yeah what i will say immediately to tear it down a peg because i just built it up so much right it means so fucking little no it doesn't mean why anything. does it matter why did he have to lay there? Why couldn't there be a gun and a fucking, you know, yeah, he didn't matter. need to be there. Well, he really didn't need to be laying on the set that right. entire time, yeah. which is a funny, you want to kind of explain that? Yeah. Tobin Bell actually spent his working hours laying on the linoleum laying on the floor, floor of the bathroom. Didn't want to, didn't want to use a, <laughs> a dummy, a stand in, all sorts of things they could have done. Um, But when he gets up, it. It's mind-boggling for the few seconds it takes you to realize that he didn't need to be there. No, nope, not um, at all. But that, it's, it's the Jason moment. It's where you realize that you've watched an entire movie sans Jigsaw, yeah. and it's the first <laughs> Saw movie. Yeah, and you know, I guess they reveal that whole thing soon enough. I mean, he's not hanging out in the closet very long before it's, oh, Michael Emerson is actually you know, kind of playing this other character and then they start showing his face a lot, but there's obviously something a little bit deeper that they're not telling mm-hmm. you, you know, not quite yet. The The performance that Emerson's giving here is pretty deliberate. He's the, you know, the crazy looking guy in the background of the scene that you're not yeah. supposed to suspect, but everybody suspects. And he doesn't get a lot of opportunity to showcase the sort of the quiet, mousy, you know, He's just kind of got this this way about him where you know there are secrets buried behind him. Yep. You know that he's got a lot. You know, he's operating on 15 layers uh, in his head at all times. You're constantly questioning his motivation. You never really know where he stands. He's just this character of, of utter enigma. He's great at, at playing that guy. Um, which is why it's also kind of a shame that he's one of the few actors who only shows up in one movie. Right. You know, the first movie has a couple of those. The first, um, the very first time you hear that, what people think of as the Saw theme, uh, is in that scene. You know, that's one of many, many times we'll hear that again throughout the movies. It's um, on the original score, it's called Hello Zep, right? Named after his character. That's the first version, but there are... Man, there are literally 30-some-odd versions of that song between all the different movies. Mm-hmm. It became really this this infamous track. It was used uh, in all these trailers, even in other films, yep. um, in uh, a lot of kind of moments where you need to... You know, it adds the feeling of the Saw movies. Yeah. Of, it almost classes them up a bit. It gives them this very broad, expansive feeling, but tonally it adds like a little mystery, a little sure. softness to it, a little bit of it almost adds subtlety mm-hmm. somehow to it. And it's just, a, you know, it's a great haunting little tune. I love that it's used so heavily in the other Saw movies because it's called Hello Zep. Yeah. It's not the Jigsaw theme, it's not the reveal theme. I mean, that's how they start using it, but. It's Zepp's way of showing up in every movie when Michael Emerson is not showing up <laughs> in every movie. It's almost a little tribute to him every time it happens. 
Uh, you hear it most heavily in this movie when they do that reveal at the end. That's when it, it swells up right. and it's used in pretty much the ending of everything. One thing that's picked up a lot later uh, as a big icon is these pig masks, these animal masks. Uh-huh. That's one of, I mean, from a, a direction standpoint, the the best, you get that scary parking garage scene where, um, you know, he's crawling on the, the ground and then you kind of do that fast Japanese ghost story sure. edit. Right. Um, it's crawling, the first... wearing the animal mask. It's just, it's terrifying. Right. It's a very early Dunn got pigged in the franchise. Dunn got pigged. So the one last thing I wanted to talk about before we move on to the second Saw movie is that this was originally filmed as a, a 10 minute short. Uh-huh. You know, it had no budget. Uh, I think it largely focused on the the two guys in the room. Although I'll be honest, I haven't seen it. It's um it's also where Hello Zep originally appeared uh, when Clauser did it for that, and it was used to pitch this movie to the studio. So Lionsgate, I mean, this is kind of interesting. Lionsgate existed in the '90s. It was a thing. It was around, and before Saw, I mean, they they'd done a pretty good amount of movies. They had uh, just the stuff we've done on the show, American Psycho, Secretary, um, Shadow of the Vampire was uh-huh. a, a Lionsgate one, House of a Thousand Corpses. But I mean, after Saw, it just exploded. And it started doing way more horror, too. Sure. You know, Lionsgate itself became this kind of horror empire. I mean, okay, so just to think about the, the scope of stuff they've done, The Punisher... That's the only movie I actually didn't just name that we've done on the show before Saw came out. Wow. I have now listed it there. Every pre-Saw Lionsgate movie on Double Feature has been listed. There are so many that happened after Saw. It's, uh, I mean, it's dozens, man. It's maybe in the range of 30 or 40 movies wow. that we've done that are <laughs> Lionsgate films that came out after Saw because of the popularity of this movie. You know, they uh, discovered what they could do with a, a kind of indie horror franchise. And they started, I mean, they just ran all directions with that. You know, it wasn't just, oh, what other mystery, puzzle piece, whatever. Right. Or chop up things can we do? It's, you know, open water. And it's, I mean, just tons and tons of these. Probably 75% of the horror movies we've done on the show have been Lionsgate movies. And, you know, we owe that. We owe a lot of those movies ever being made at all to the popularity of Saw and what that did for that studio. It kind of reminds me a lot of, uh, you know, Dimension and the the Halloween yeah, stuff. Sure. We've seen that with a lot of slasher franchises. They, they pay the bills for these studios that otherwise wouldn't be named studios that we know. So uh, before we move into Saw 2, I'm just going to really quickly read off. I, I, I took some notes. Oh, uh, did you? For a change. Okay. So the tagline for Saw uh-huh. is, how much blood would you shed to stay alive? Okay. Simple, Simple question. Enough. Very similar to what would you do for a Klondike bar? Um, <laughs> now for the right. second film, and this is this is one of my favorite taglines of all time, especially because when you watch Saw 2 and Jigsaw says it, he's so fucking maniacal. Jigsaw says it. So I don't know what it is yet. Uh, the Saw movies are uh, a few, very few of the films we've ever done where I purposefully have avoided the taglines uh-huh. because I knew that you knew all about them. But your tagline was Home Alone from Hell, which I yeah, thought was pretty that good. Was, what's the actual tagline? The actual tagline is, oh yes, there will be blood. Um, not even going to touch that. You start to see a lot more of our killer in this movie, of yeah. John. Unlike, um, say, Seven, right, where our killer is a man, Saw says that Jigsaw is a legend. Sure. And uh, before, he was just lying on the floor of a dirty bathroom, uh-huh. so not not very legendary, maybe. But in this movie, we get the cloak. It's ceremonial. He is the end-all, be-all villain. Right. He really is. He's uh, He's not just everything he's built up to be, but he's even more than that. Sure. And... You know, as a villain himself, we get a little time to sit down and, and talk to this guy. Right. He likes to be called John. Yep. He tries to be a little humble about being a mastermind, but he slides into it right oh, away. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing about John Kramer is that he is so fucking methodical and smart and well thought out mm-hmm. that he creates and crafts these brilliant machines. Sure. 
And then he's an he, engineer. And then he likes to sit in the middle of them and watch people squirm. Sure. And the whole time he sits there and gives them clues, which are, in all honesty, really subtle the first time you watch the movie right. and painfully right. obvious the second time you watch the movie. Yeah. A really good example is in Saw 2 when D Wall, uh, Donnie Wahlberg. Um, yeah, I'm sure. You're uh, just going to call him D Wall? Yeah. Detective That's, Matthews. Okay. Uh, Asks where his son is, and yeah. Jigsaw replies with, "He's in a safe place." Oh yeah, right. And then they they hit you over the head with it later. Just yeah. fucking bash it in, Donnie. Man, the way he rolls his eyes when John does start to get preachy, yeah. it makes that scene perfect because we get all the info out about his criminal mastermindedness, but it makes it uh, it makes the movie not seem cliche. Sure. You know, the uh, the movie itself is an eye rolling. There's a character in the frame who is rolling his eyes at the stupid stuff coming out of this man's mouth. Well, and essentially what happens as the franchise goes on, and this is the first example of it, is it's Jigsaw with his philosophical blah blah, here's sure, my ideology sure. of the world. Sure. And as the films progress, fewer and fewer people agree with him. Yeah, right. It starts off wow, he's got this armada of underground philosophers who want to change the way the world works sure. and fix the broken machine. And then Saw 2, and he kind of seems crazy, and it's a little bit mad scientist, mice in a rat cage. Sure, yeah. And Donnie Wahlberg is the first character to go, oh, come on, can we please just, you're a bad guy. Yeah, right. Brings that sort of uh, blue-collar, keep-it-simple mentality right. to it. So when you have a man that you've been led to believe is uh, such a big guy and so ceremonial and is the the dark presence that he's he's told to be, it's kind of off putting for me to see him drinking out of a straw and yeah. eating eating oatmeal out of a little floral cup. You know what I mean? You forget that uh that he's sick, that he's dying, and so when you see him in that state with his little sippy glass. It uh it brings all that stuff back home. It just informs that character a lot more. So I want to talk some more about the different crew we have now. Uh-huh. So this isn't James Wan. No, it's not. We, it's Darren Lynn Bowsman. Darren Lynn Bowsman, who is of Repo fame. Yeah, well, um, who is of Saw fame? Well, previously on Double Feature, of Repo fame. Definitely the case. Um, but Definitely actually case. of Saw 2, 3, and 4 fame. Yeah. Yeah, and Bowsman, I mean, he's got some uh, some directing chops in, in these movies. You know, we start to see where the acting is uh, suddenly comparatively awesome. Um, where Bowsman maybe doesn't have incredible strength as the, you know, from the production side of things, uh, that's already been built up. That's not something he needs to, to carry into this project. Right. He instead co wrote this and, um, and does the directing. And, you know, even by the less known actors, the direction, for as far as it seems to influence those actors, I mean, everybody seems pretty stellar. Sure. But I'm curious about the the writing angle, because it's something that was kind of weird. You know, Bowsman wrote a different movie. He wrote a separate movie, and the studio kind of looked at it, and eventually it was adapted into being the second Saw movie. Yeah. So that's where he paired back up with the writer. Uh, Lee Winnell. But uh, yeah, he paired back up with him and they said, you know, we think we can kind of adapt this and make this into another song. And it flows, I mean, seamlessly. You'd have no idea. Yeah. Well, but the thing that stands out to me about Saw 2, and I told you I was going to ask you this, mm -hmm. but does Saw 2 to you feel like the black sheep of the entire franchise? Because Saw 2 is the one where it's, we, we talk about it later on, but where the A story is the people in the house. Yeah, right. And the B story is the detectives trying to figure it out. And it's also, I mean, they kind of parody it a little bit right. during uh, Saw 5. Mm -hmm. But it's the one where it's a bunch of subjects all in the same place, sure. all having to figure things out. But it's divided into individual trials for each of them. And whether they actually do their own trials or they just throw Shawnee Smith into sure, the yeah. pool of syringes. Yeah. Is... God, that's that fucking needle pit is the <laughs> worst place to be. It's not uh it's definitely not the worst trap in no. these movies. 
but it's not oh god i just don't want her to go in it and she does for me the needle pit is the first moment in the saw franchise where i wince and realize oh wow this is a very fucked up yeah it's where i realize that the boundaries that i had drawn for saw traps were very very far from how they were how they could go. go yeah yeah definitely yeah, the um, you know I'll get back to that question about Black Sheep um, when we go later in the franchise because I think we have a little bit of a spirit fingers moment, yeah. although not quite nearly as ridiculous as those movies get. But I like that about this movie. I oh, guess me I was too. blinded for how I like that. Hey, now we have a survivor pack. Yep. We're starting to feel more slashery a little yep. bit. Um, we have uh, you know I assume the stuff that Bowsman wrote in is most of that and kind of that. Uh, sins of our fathers storyline mm. that um, you know the kid's dad put everybody else away, which is a really really interesting thing that you know suddenly in dealing with our human dynamics and thinking about how do these characters feel about each other as they learn a little bit and how does one play off another and is there one person in the pack everybody hates you know all of these these different pieces of chemistry of of their dynamic once it's introduced that his dad put the people away uh, in kind of a shady manner. It's great to see, you know, what's going to be the result of that. Are they going to hate him? Is that, I mean, that is the idea of sins of our fathers. It's, it's everyone hating you for something really he had no control over. Right. It's just who his dad is. And there's a couple ways he could potentially react to that. I mean, I think the smartest thing to do when you're really trying to force, um, compassion in that situation make sure everyone doesn't hate you is to go well how do you think i feel i had to live with the guy i hate him too you know try and get on the Mm -hmm. on the side of these other people you're with but you know he's so shocked by the situation he can't think to do anything of the sort and he doesn't know who these people i mean that's you know that's hindsight being 2020 obviously in the situation he's in he's just fucked they just that's another thing that's going to make everybody gang up (laughs) on him which is another great part of that group dynamic is to see who is, you know, the odd man out and how sure. that changes, how everybody can grow. They can bond over hating one person and especially when that one person becomes somebody else or if that one person, usually in a in a group movie like this, they're one of the last people to die. We oh, yeah. see that in almost every single one of these movies, uh, Saw or the other group pack movies, because you have to continue that bond. But when the person dies prematurely, then it's interesting to see how that dynamic shifts among those people. Uh, the, uh, another person uh, involved in kind of the making of these movies is Kevin. Uh, how do you pronounce Ke- his last name? I believe name? it's pronounced Grudert, but that's just a rough, disgusting he did, double um, feature pronunciation. He did the editing. So it's the first five Saw movies. Okay. Um, and then on the, the sixth and seventh, he'll actually go on to direct and we'll eventually see that. So the edits get uh, a little more advanced in this. They get a little more refined. It's just, again, getting back to that idea of kind of looking at the first one as a demo. Sure. Looking at the first one as the, that rough mix of things and seeing how they could... I mean, they really don't become a lot more subtle. They kind of just get pushed in uh, in different directions. Yeah. And, you know, we have a little bit of kind of the Bowsman transitions that'll also work hand-in-hand hand with the editing that'll get weirder as time goes on. And then, of course, Claws are returning. So the the score is interesting to me in contrast to the last one because it's incredibly representative of Saw realizing what it's becoming. You see that with production values all around, whether it's the editing or the just the, the quality of filmmaking, the quality of set design and machinery and stuff mm-hmm. that they're, they're using for these movies. But uh, the score is bigger. There's a lot more of it. It's a lot more, um, you know, from the the progress of what he's doing writing wise. It's interesting because he's weaving together sort of the the creepy, airy ambience kind of music with the metal. Those are starting to become some of the same pieces, uh, which makes the pieces themselves, you know, a lot more dynamic. But it's also giving it a little more what will become the distinct sound of the the Saw films. That uh, that chirpy synthetic sound, the uh, you know more synthy FM noise, more of the the heavy banging piano, 
And the second movie, especially uh, a little bit different than all the other movies, has these very distinct bass parts, a lot more memorable. They have a lot more character to them. Um, the score for this movie got its own release. It's uh, the first one in the franchise, and we'll talk a little bit about how these things get released in kind of a weird way. But it got a full set of, you know, here is every single piece of music from this entire thing. And that's in addition to a separate soundtrack that continued the trend of kind of metal and new sure. metal and industrial and stuff. Um, one of which contains uh, one of the first Pussifer really songs, um, Rev 2220, yeah. the remix version, which is a, a fucking great song. But that the soundtrack version only contains, I think it's just the one, might be a couple, um, Charlie Clauser songs. It's Don't Forget the Rules. That's the big one which is a play on Hello Zepp. It's, um, it's kind of a longer combination of, you know, the three or four different times that it shows up in this movie, making mm-hmm. it into rather a minute and a half piece, just one five minute long version of the song. I mention it because don't forget the rules for a lot of people is one of the first, you know, it's the, the go-to version of this, the distinct version, probably because of its length and just the, the renewed type of, of quality you get yeah. from the second Saw movie, just finally nailing production-wise what would be kind of the sound going forward. You weren't thinking of talking about Clauser, though. You were thinking yeah. about talking about Shawnee. Yeah, uh, in this I, movie. I am in love with Shawnee Smith yeah, in, definitely. Uh, in, in the Saw films. And she was in the first one. She has mm-hmm. a really... That's the thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. She uh, She's briefly in the first film, and that's something that the Saw films do really, really interestingly with characters is they give them very brief introductions in a film, and then the sequel, they're the main character. Oh, sure. Well, Detective uh, Allison Kelly, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, brief part and then becomes really kind of a right. main character. And Hoffman and Rig are also yeah. examples for later on. But we have Shawnee Smith who plays Amanda, and she escapes from the reverse bear trap in the first film. And then she comes back and plays sort of a jigsaw double agent mm-hmm. in Saw Two. She also plays. Um, she uh, she's the character that swims through the needles. Sure. Yeah. Um, but she's just this really frenetic, intense character whose role is solely to be scared because she's been here before. Kind of push these characters in the direction they need to actually understand. Because mm-hmm. otherwise they're just going to freak out and all kill each other. Yeah. Um, which they do anyway. Yeah. But she Well, is... they can't just kill each other because of the numbers. I thought that was a really interesting mechanic where they kind of... It forces this thing where they need each other. Right. And just when you get comfortable with that being a security blanket, uh, it only takes one guy to say, fuck that. I'm just going to chop the number right. off the back of my neck. Right. And... uh and and she does a really good job of being convincing and you feel so much for her. And then when she turns out to be the bad guy, you kind of just get really mad. Yeah. Um, and then she's in one more film. Yeah, we end on the reveal montage, uh-huh. which becomes kind of a thing in the Saw movies. Rather than her playing the mole and doing that, that thing you know I love, that kind of uh, 24 Jack Bauer, who's the mole, you know, guessing game. Um, rather than it being, oh, there's a traitor in our midst, who is it? It's just a sudden, unexpected reveal, a what a twist kind of reveal at the end. I think we were calling those mind freaks, yeah. right? Where, uh, hey, there's been a traitor in your midst the entire time, and you had no idea. And so we get a reveal montage, which any other time we might, you know, we might mock, but it's made okay because of how exciting the possibilities are going forward. You know, Shawnee fucking Smith, and uh, and then that ending, mm-hmm. you, know, you, you have the spot where this movie's going to end. And I just think to myself, come on, you can do it, movie. This is the right place. Everything's just kind of broken down. And you go, wow, a lot of heavy stuff was just dropped in my lap. And then you feel the tiny break where the score dies out. Mm-hmm. And they're going to give you the wrap up scene. And they don't. They fucking don't. <laughs> they just end the movie. It's the first real heavy saw victory. A lot of these moments I get where seeing the franchise for the first time, I go, "Wow, this could this could go either way. What are they gonna What are they gonna do here?" I'm waiting in yeah. suspense as I imagine people do during sports games. 
is kind of going, well, what's there's only so many seconds left. Mm-hmm. What, what's going to happen here? And Saw just fucking delivers. It just nails that ending. I root for the movie. I say, come on, just have the balls to, to end it here. And it does. Shawnee, goddamn Smith, and that ending. So the third film, she's a lot more instrumental in. Sure. Now, these films, uh, we haven't addressed this, but they have great titles. Yeah. Um, the title of the first Saw was Saw. The The title of the second Saw? Uh, I believe it's called Saw 2. Yeah. So that would make the title of the third Saw. It's uh, Saw 3. Yeah, right. Saw Every 3. game has its loopholes. <laughs> no, that's not the title of the third Saw. Well, we miss our, our you know, bad secondary post colon. Sure title on the movie so that's one of the reasons i'm very glad you've brought the uh, what's the what's the tagline it there's there's three okay there's every game has its loopholes Uh uh-huh then there's the there's the jigsaw quote suffering you haven't seen anything yet okay and then and and this is this is a big deal sure there's also the tagline if it's halloween it must be saw ah yes the uh I was going to call it infamous, but for as many infamous things as there are in this franchise, no, I'm going to give that one credit. That's one of the few things I knew about Saw before going into it. You've kept Saw. It's a it's a well-kept secret for you. Yeah. There are so many tie-ins and things that over the years you have not let me in on because we've been planning this for yep. so long. So kudos to you, by the way, Thank you. for that. Hard work. But um, if it's Halloween, it must be Saw, which is really my favorite thing to make fun of from the <laughs> Saw franchise. Because if it's anything, it must be saw is, yeah. a, is a funny thing to say. The story here picks up. So just to be just to be um, clear here, uh, it's not Saw Three colon. If it's Halloween, it must no, be Saw. It's but saw it's funnier three. to think of it right. that way. Um, the story picks up right where we left off on the previous yeah. one. It's already becoming a rough week for nondescript section of probably New York City. Right. Amanda um, comes back, and Amanda, uh, Shawnee Smith's character, is fucking boss. Yeah, she, you know, she is the slasher now. Uh, this has become uh, really quite a little team they've put together. Right. Well, you get this this thing that you don't realize is going to happen, and then mm. it happens so hard in yeah. this movie. Sure. You realize Jigsaw isn't a person. Mm-hmm. Jigsaw. Is an idea. Yeah, he's it's a legend. A movement. Yeah, it's this thing because and you mentioned it um, when we were talking about Saw Two. The mm-hmm. the idea of legend, the idea of his persona out existing his actual physicality because he's a sick dying old man, right? But still able to hatch these brilliant plans. Well, and he needs help. That's where Michael Emerson's character sure. came in. Is you know we needed Zep to run around and do things, and now between Amanda and Zep, I mean it's uh it's just a little collection that's growing. Right, and Saw Three take, and I mean I know this is later in the film, but it's easily the most notable thing that happens. Saw Three, the third film in the Saw franchise, is the film where Jigsaw dies. <laughs> right, there are four films yeah. after this film. It's true. It's not even halfway through the franchise yet. John Kramer dies. Yeah, and. Jigsaw doesn't. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. John Kramer dies. Jigsaw Does not lives die. on. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That sounds like it's probably going to be a tagline from a future film. Uh, I love seeing. You know, uh, so we kind of set Amanda up as maybe she will carry on the legacy, yeah. or you know, we find out towards the end of the movie what's actually going sure. on there. But she's seeing her as our day in day out showrunner is fantastic. Especially considering where we came from, you know, like you were mentioning in the second one, and as they remind us in, in what will become these characteristic, these signature flashbacks, uh, she was fragile. Yeah. She, and, you know, some of it may have been an act. In fact, a, a lot of it may have been an sure. act from what we eventually find out. But she, uh, she was a frail, destroyed, devastated girl, and she had problems even far before that. And uh, to see her now in a state, I mean, that says something for the the actor, but it also says something for that character that she goes from being completely devastated, taking a dramatic story arc into being completely empowered like this. Mm-hmm. Um, whether the the reasons for her doing it are 
just or not. I mean, they're not. Of course, she's killing. There's, there's right. no fucking reason for it. But the fact that she's gone that direction, she's gone down that dark path, and we're seeing uh, just the transformation from who she used to be to who she is, comparatively, the two, I mean, it's it's just really impressive as a character. I like seeing, uh, in addition to where she's come from, the thing I love about the third saw is the play between uh, her and the doctor. And yeah, Lynn. Lynn. Um, seeing how, you know, they have Lynn as the, the prisoner. Right. And you might think that, you know, this could become a Stockholm Syndrome kind of thing. Sure. Or, well, I mean, the Hippocratic Oath kind of Yeah, that plays into, into it a little bit there, too. Where, yeah, she but has there's to also, take care of it. I, there's the thing, you know, with Amanda. There's that kind yeah. of uh, daughter caretaker, I guess, yeah. kind of relationship right. where they're at conflict. She's, uh, I mean, somebody's moving in on her territory and she doesn't like it. Mm-hmm. And so these guys are constantly at odds. I mean, that kind of comes to a head when you see the power struggle between these two women. Uh, it's, it's fun watching how things turn when Jigsaw um, orders Amanda to let Lynn go. And how Lynn doesn't like that. That's the first time she's disagreed right. blatantly with what he said. You know, she has been under his wing. And to complete her transformation as a character, we're now seeing her defiant of the man who used to be master. Mm-hmm. He's undergoing brain fucking surgery right. right now. So he is clearly not in the position of power. This is her taking hold of the operation. This is her putting her foot down and saying... You don't control things anymore. This is now, we're going to play by my rules. We are not doing this. And kind of the repercussions of what happens and how that changes the dynamic between those three characters. And the other thing, and while all of this is going on, of course, <laughs> sure, sure. is the, uh, you know, the old saw people are being slaughtered in horrible and sadistic ways. Oh, yeah, that ways. happens as well. Um, but the one thing that Saw 3 does that, uh, it's a trend for the rest of the franchise is the uh, the trap gauntlet, where yeah. you have a character or characters who go from place to place, from point A to point B, and in point B they have the option or choice, or they're forced into saving someone's right. life or letting them die. Right. Then that lets them into the next room, where they have to do it again and again and again, until at the very end, there's some twist, and they die. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's something that the movies, uh, you know, that's their their bread and butter. That is their, uh, I was going to make a joke, a pig joke about bringing home the bacon, but that is one of the cores of the movies. On the, on a surface level, I think that's why a lot of people come to see a franchise like Saw is because they have these kills and these traps. And, you know, it's it's weird because we're watching all these in a marathon format and we haven't talked about the specific traps uh, a lot up to this point. I'll be honest with you. That's because I'm not sure I like the traps. They wear on you when you watch them yeah. this close back to back. It's, uh, I mean, it's great that they're in the movie. I wouldn't change anything sure. about that. But I don't like to think back on them because it's not fond for me. Right. It's this thing where, you know, we won't have the big tired conversation about torture porn right. again and again on this show. But this was, I mean, we can't go through the whole show and never talk about it. Yeah. This is uh, one of the the biggest things that's drug out every time well, people talk about it. It was the that. first popularization of something this fucking sadistic. It was. It was. And these movies capitalize on that a lot. Yeah. To a point where you watch enough of it and anybody, even you or I, has to go, wow, do people really just want to go to the movies and watch people get tortured like yeah. this? I wouldn't say that after one film or two films, maybe not even three but by the fourth film, I'm thinking, we're watching a lot of people tortured for what now seems like a very long amount of time. Fuck, man, I need a break. It's not even that, that hostile thing, where in hostile, it's pitch perfect. You get the, uh, the human being suffering in small enough amounts that it's doing something artistically for the film. It's doing something important to the story, the narrative, what the, uh, the movie's trying to convey. And it's doing it in a, in a very artistic kind of manner, especially that, that second hostile movie. But today, as we're watching this, just today, because we're watching them all back to back, there's so much of it that it weighs on me. It becomes an an endurance test of misery, really. How much suffering I can watch other people go through before it crosses my cinematic threshold 
And I just go, man, this sucks for all the, it enters into, I mean, almost needing bad cat kind of, yep. uh, kind of territory. But that's part of the legend of Jigsaw. We wouldn't have Jigsaw without that. And we really, this is our last opportunity to show what's going on around him before he dies. I think the movie does a great job of building him up in these final moments. He's weak, but the flashbacks we get of him in this film, these are grander days than his, uh, Mm -hmm. let's say, his oatmeal days. This is, um, that's another thing I love about the third one is seeing their behind the scenes operation. Sure. The uh, the rooms full of traps they have really getting an insider's perspective on okay so this isn't just Enigma anymore we're not just going oh there's a jigsaw guy we'll tell you as little as we can about him to make him a big man of mystery right. now we want to see his operation I want to go to his warehouse and see all his stupid traps sure. hanging around well know? and that's eventually what the franchise turns into that it does yeah that's I mean that's the, the thing about look. something like Saw three is. It it's this weird turn where the traps and the killing and the slaughter take a back seat to the plot. Yeah. And that's not something that people when looking at the Saw franchise at face value ever think. No. People won't watch the Saw movies because they think, oh, it's a bunch of people getting killed. Honestly, I am more intrigued and interested sure. by how these characters intertwine and it just like excuse me, I'm just really excited. Saw 3 is the last hurrah for the plot being easy to follow. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, do yourself uh do yourself the exercise, perform that. Go just read synopsises. Synopsis. Synopsis. Of, synopsis. Uh synopsis, sure, let's go with that. Of the English language of these movies. They are, I mean, it's like a complicated soap opera. Yeah. They're incredibly hard to follow. There's all these names. I mean, as you're reading them, you start to think, is this the movie where people get chopped up? Right. Because I don't... Why do I have to know who all these doctors are and who the the bureaucratic infrastructure of... I mean, it's crazy the amount of things you have to remember. Especially, you know, this this movie starts um, giving you the backstory. We see Jigsaw. I mean, painting Billy, which is great. But uh, the retcons. The retcons are everywhere. We are dropping them into the fiction... Like, they are going out of fucking style. It is, uh, you know, Amanda is really the reason for that. We have Amanda going into the fiction in all different parts in the timeline. It's my favorite kind of retcon. So in a lot of slasher movies, we'll talk about retcons because one crew picks up for another crew. And, you know, retcon stands for retroactive continuity. People familiar with the Killapalooza series will be well familiar with this. But a new troop of people come in. They want to change things up, but they don't want to just, you know, betray the old continuity. So they'll say, actually, it happened this way, or you were missing this detail, right. or here's an added level. So there's a couple ways you can do these retcons as we've explored, but this is really my favorite way. It's to add secret history. Mm-hmm. It's to say that, you know, little did you know, Hellboy style, that Hitler was actually conducting these secret... That's the right. big one always, World War II and Hitler sure. and occult experiments and all that stuff. Uh, the Saw movies say, it happened just like we showed you. We didn't lie about any of that, but there was a little more going on behind the scenes sure. you weren't quite aware of. And now rather than just tell you that and expect you to buy it, which is what a lot of movies do, these come out year after year, we're just going to show you another version of that scene. In fact, we're going to get together all the actors in the same fucking costumes, introduce another actor, and then replay a tiny bit of the previous scene to make you think, we really shot all that. Yeah. We just didn't show it to you to really make you buy that. It's a hard thing to get people to buy, but if it can ever be done, I think it can be done you know, by Saw in this manner. With Amanda, I mean, showing how far back it goes is really a, one of the most incredible things. Every time you take a step back, you go, wow, she was in on it that long, Uh that long. Wow. Even that she was there for that moment. And that kind of wow, aha moment you get is, is something you'll become familiar with throughout the rest of the series. (laughs) So, uh, there's some other new actors. I mean, the, so you came up with this expression as we were watching the movies of getting pigged. Done got pigged. Can you, uh, (laughs) yeah, thanks. Can you kind of explain that? Um, well, (laughs) Basically, what ends up happening, and it it really gets locked in right around the third and fourth Saw film, uh, is you have a character, 
and you don't know why you're following them. You mm-hmm. haven't they're not a character you're familiar with. Sure. And then suddenly they're alone. Yeah. And right. within five seconds You know why they're there. Someone with a pig mask is going to grab them and pull them off the frame. They done get pigged. They done get pigged. And uh so it just became a thing now. Whenever you see the character it's fun because you sit there and it's not that the film is failing. It's that you start to feel uneasy and then my brain just goes, oh, Dunn got pigged. Oh, yeah, they're going to get pigged. Yeah. That's what's about to happen. And sure enough, pig men show up like the uh, the infamous idea of men in black uh, taking them away into the night, whether it's through flashback, finding out how they got somewhere. The pig men really become... You know, when I think back to the Saw movies, I don't feel like um, we all remember Saw as having a bunch of pigmen in it. Right. But that's that's one of the staples that Absolutely. comes back more than anything else. The pigmen start to increase in frequent uh, in uh, what's the, the word I want? There's a, a greater number of them. Sure. Every fucking time. Well, and isn't uh, isn't the poster one of the alternate posters for Saw 4 just the pigman? It's true. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's the pig mask. It's a great, uh, great poster. Well, before we get into that, that's not even the most uh, the the pig scene that I like the most out of the third Saw movie. Uh the fucking the scene where the pigs are getting squished up and thrown in the <laughs> yeah. slop bowl. First of all, I love the score in that moment. It is one of my favorite pieces throughout any of the stuff. We talked a lot about the Zep song, and that's the big iconic piece. But that's not my favorite stuff. My favorite stuff is the grindy metal assault stuff. And when you get that ass kicking, you know, during the the maggoty uh, pig on the conveyor belt kind of thing, uh-huh. I believe that that track is called Pig Juicer. So here's something that's great about these Causer songs. Um, as I listen to these albums, and I listen to them all, all of the score for Saw, I listened to it a bunch before we were watching this. Because as I've mentioned a million times to you and on our show, I was excited like you would not believe. Mm -hmm. You and I kept trying to fit this in during previous weeks of Double Feature. We would keep, I mean, the the schedule just gets so busy as we're coming up with stuff and doing all this stuff. But we kept saying, oh, we have have a couple days off. We don't have to do Double Feature anything. Can we watch the Saw movies? And it just never worked out. But we were so anxious to do these. So I was listening to the score this whole time and getting super into it. And... Uh, I would take screenshots as I'm listening, you know, to play back on my iPhone. I would basically screenshot the tracks I liked, which is a way for me to kind of flip through later and just see, okay, I can go through all these screenshots and I can say, there's the, the particular time at which I, you know, I was listening to it and went, oh, this is a great track in case it's kind of long. It would give me the name, the, the movie. Uh, it's a way that I've kind of found of making a playlist of songs from scores that I like. It's something I started doing right after the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo score came out. Because uh-huh. the fucking score is even longer, I kid you not, than the movie. So I needed a way to go through this and kind of go, I just want to make a playlist for when I don't have three hours. I have 20 to 40 minutes and I want to listen to some of my favorite tracks. How am I ever going to learn this stuff? There's just so much to take in. So you go through all the saw scores and you take screenshots. And the great thing about this is as uh, the names for these tracks, I mean, they're so crude. The, um, you know, we're watching the movie this time, the pig thing comes up and I go, oh, I remember this song. I really like this track. I go back to my iPhone and I flip through the things and it's literally called pig juicer you know the names are so crude it's it's really funny to see how easily i can watch a scene and then flip through and go oh yeah it's probably this song because of the the name that it's given so that's one of the gory moments but i think uh you know this says something great kind of about censorship and about gore there's a a few times in the franchise another one in particular we'll get to that says something about gore i love that the brain surgery in here is worse than any of the traps in the entire movie that, I mean, far and away, that is the oh, scene. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? And what's great is, you know, we're watching the unrated versions of all these. The brain surgery scene is identical in the theatrical yep. and in the unrated. So it's one of the hardest scenes, but it is not, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, something that was 
you know, I mean, it's identical. It's no different in the unrated version. It's, um, it's, you know, censorship wise, it's one of those things you just get away with it because, oh, it's surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But man, is it uncomfortable. And it's these macro shots and you can tell they really, they put a lot of time polishing that particular section of the movie. That's one that really stands out. There's actually three versions of this movie. For a lot of these films, there's just the two. But this one, I mean, we watched the unrated. It came out at the, uh, at the same time as the DVD release did. There's also the director's cut of yeah. the film, which is a cut Bowsman did that is over two hours. Has a little bit of a, an alternate ending stuff. We honestly, we just don't have time to talk about it. But it's out there, and we'll probably have links to it. Um, to kind of some of the differences, and you can see that. Mm-hmm. Tell me the uh, the title of the fourth Saw movie is Saw 4. It's called Saw 4, and it has my favorite tagline of all the Saw films. Tell me, what is it? It's a trap. That's the tagline. That's the tagline. The, the tagline for Saw, Saw 4. 4. <laughs> it's a trap. It's a trap. Oh, my God. Beautiful. So, um, <laughs> Jigsaw's actually dead, first Jigsaw's of all. Dead. Which is something I didn't believe. Film opens with Jigsaw's oh autopsy, which is actually out of chronological order, which lets you know where this franchise is headed. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, which is, I uh, love that they do that in the yeah, beginning. It's they headed go, he's into, so dead, we're going to show you his fucking <laughs> autopsy. It's, it's, it's headed to a place where it unapologetically shows you stuff and makes you figure out where it is chronologically. Based, oh yeah, it doesn't give a based fuck on, about you. Based on John Kramer's hair. Yeah, um, yeah, that's about your that's your your key indicator, your lead indicator. The uh, the two things that I think are the things to remind people what film Saw Four is mm-hmm. because Saw Four, Saw Five, and Saw Six, well, not so much Six for you, uh, get a little confusing because they're so dense. They are, yeah. There's Saw, a lot of stuff packed in there. Saw Four is the ice block one uh-huh. where Rig is the main character yeah. rig is doing the gauntlet sure and d wall is standing on ice and uh it's, yeah it's also the one with the cross film hamster style oh which yeah is something we've never seen before it's um i mean hamster style is uh, maybe because we've been using it so long it's the broadest umbrella we could possibly cast we include everything as, you know, hamster style. The idea of hamster style just being there's an arbitrary thing earlier in the movie. It becomes really fucking important later in the movie. Here we're laying some groundwork for it. It's it's purposeful, but there is, um, you know, I, I'll call it a hamster style just because I want there to be such a thing as a cross film hamster style. Uh-huh. There's that little, the little thing, little trap kind of weird thing he sets up in the end of the third movie that just isn't talked about. Yep. It's a cut to kind of scene it cuts back to him and we just never discuss it and then it comes back you know in a big way in the next film which is curious because uh i mean we've done a great job honestly setting up for this um we brought in jigsaw's former lover as well and she's gonna you know play a big part in here she really had no uh, other than to give that character a little humanity there was no reason to even show her in the last movie but we bring her in, and then she plays a big part. And then also, we've uh, we've got this flashback mechanism that gives them the precedent to keep bringing Tobin Bell back yeah, into the movies. Exactly. Which is great, because he shows up in basically all the movies yeah. in some capacity. And we've got Billy the Puppet. So um, I don't think they ever call him Billy, and no, that's just kind of so what, he's, what he's known as, uh, what the crew calls him. Sure. We've got him to represent the the icon stand in so we can still have trailers and posters and go, what's jigsaw going to do this time? Because jigsaw is kind of now the puppet. What I was going to mention about the writing is this is uh, Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan who are doing this now. Uh So whereas we had the same writer, Uh, Lee Winnell, so good at this. (laughs) Uh, Lee Winnell wrote the first three. We now have our two writers who are going to lead us through the rest of the franchise. We're going to do every movie from here on out. So it kind of begs the question, did Lee set these things up and intend to pay them off himself? Did he just kind of think they weren't important? I mean, it treats them like they're going to come back, sure. some of them. Uh, did the new writers just kind of get mysteries that they could do their own whatever with? Oh, there were, he was setting up a weird thing on the table. What was he doing? I don't know. Just do whatever you want with it. <laughs> you know. So it's, it's uh, really intriguing to me to kind of think of 
what situation did the writers, these new writers, find themselves in when paying off moments from the previous film? Because they'll go on to create their own payoff moments. Sure. They were obviously fans of that. Um, one of the other things that you know these guys were pretty big fans of is starting to comment on stranger issues in the movies. You know, we've been just killing people who are bad for a while now. So we start to get into, I mean, I, I feel like they almost comment on stranger things out of pure necessity at this point. Yeah. We've just been doing so many killings that, sure. you know, now we're talking about domestic violence, right. for instance. Well, because murderer, child rapist, and, you know, cutting yourself that yeah you, right you, you can only hate those people for so long <laughs> wow cutting yourself you can only hate those people for so long yeah and no, i'd see what you're saying though i mean how many times can we put convicts together yeah in a exactly thing and, the yeah, obvious bad people are they're not even they shouldn't be jigsaw's targets yeah we're expanding beyond that we've done that it's time for new territory it's one of those great things uh, we see in horror movies and something we saw, I, you know, I think about Wishmaster as being a good example of starting to tackle more adult issues or kind of stranger issues, adultery and so forth. And uh, especially that one later movie we talked about. But this is uh, one of the great do anythings of mm -hmm. horror. You can just come in and say, let's do this. There's no one to answer to. It's a horror movie. Nobody expects anything of us. We can go any direction. You know, there are no uh, no guardians or parents watching over us. We can basically just uh, do whatever the fuck we want. And so now we're going to talk about domestic violence. And that's going to be, I mean, that seems now in retrospect, like one of the more obvious things yeah. that we'll end up talking about. Well, and for anything that's not obvious in Saw 4, they introduce this character named Agent Steven Strom. <laughs> yeah, okay, and so tell me about him. Steve Strom comes in, and he is he's the FBI character. Mm -hmm. um, him and uh, uh, Torres, I believe. Yeah. So when you were talking earlier about the pig head, you're talking about the one on the chair. That has yeah. nothing to do with our main characters. Right. That's just kind of a side... Uh, it's It's weird because, you know, on the covers of these movies... With the exception of kind of that alternate cover for the third movie, we're not really dealing a lot with getting main characters on the cover. Right. So this is where we have the pig head and the red cloak and the chair, which is, I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to say my favorite image from yeah. from any of the films. That cover's great. So, But you're, you're right. We have new main characters here. Well, we have Strom who comes in, and he's, he's a twofold thing mm -hmm. because he has a very, very wide arc. Sure. Uh, coming up in the franchise, but he's also the character that allows for a lot of really sudden, complicated shit to happen. Yeah. Because he is such a good field agent mm. that he walks into a room that is obviously set up to make it look like Rig is new Jigsaw. And he looks at the situation and goes, this is obviously a setup. Come on. We sure. can't waste our time sure. here. We have too many characters that you need to be aware of and you need to understand what's going on with this situation. Yeah. There and, starts to be some emergency to uh to how much information is being acquired at once. Right, exactly. It becomes a dire situation. Cuz there's a lot going on. It's complicated. Rig is being groomed as the new Jigsaw, but sure. he's actually being tested as to whether or not he's a good person. Right. And it's very very complicated and if you don't have Strom in there explaining every kill, yeah, and the mythology behind well, it. somebody to push it along to sure. go everything is on fire. Go go go. Yeah. Let's move. So this is the last Bosman one we're uh. going to get, the last Darren Bosman movie uh with him as the director. And I haven't mentioned these um these transitions of his a lot, but they're starting to really get crazy at this yeah. point. I mean, it started in the second saw where we were just having, we had that kind of, you know, uh, we've seen it before, the floorboard horizontal transition, you know, where the camera pans down until it starts to cut what would be under the floor of one set mm -hmm. and just transitions into the scene, you know, with the, everything moving up vertically. And then we start to get a little showier in the third one. By the fourth movie... The throwing I mean, people through windows into the police station? Yeah, right. Well, characters are walking into a scene they don't belong in, dragging their own scene behind yeah. them. You know, it's this this cut-out uh, blue screen kind of... I mean, it's probably not even blue screen. They're probably just... It doesn't matter how they're accomplishing yeah. this fucking it's transition. Magic. They're just getting absolutely uh, insane. But that's not the, um, you know, the only thing visually. I mean... 
the thing that stands out for me is that ice block. That's yeah. what I remember going back to block. the fourth movie. They're in, okay, so they're in a fucking green lit room with giant industrial fans behind them standing on, I mean, we call it the, the green ice block or whatever, but it's the green room and the red lit ice block. Uh, pillar of ice with a bunch of red lights on it. This is the modern horror set yeah. template. This is the put some green over here, put some red over here. Now you have a uh, a late, you know, um, twenty. What was this? Twenty oh seven. This yeah. came out. I forget what year we're in at this point. Uh, horror movie and everything that came out in this time had to look like it because this was a cash cow. And what do you yep. do with your film? And hey, them saw movies. They look pretty good. Uh-huh. It's also wrapping up what will be the, the last of the new scores for a little while. Um, it's first uh, of the Evolution Music Partners score. So you've probably never heard that, that term before, Evolution Music Partners. But that'll be important for anybody interested in the scores of these movies. Uh, this is really the only thing I wanted to say about the score in here, so I'll keep it brief. But the score here wasn't licensed to a recording company, so it was never released. Hmm. It is available. It's just hard to get if you're looking in kind of the usual places that you would get music because it's not, it hasn't actually been put on a CD. It's not on iTunes. You can't fucking find it to buy anywhere. It is available to stream on this Evolution Music Partners website. So what Evolution Music Partners is, it's kind of a a music talent and distribution agency that Charlie Clauser is... Uh, I guess kind of represented by uh-huh. and you can go on there and license music and stuff for your, your project. You'll see that some of the saw music specifically the, the Zep track is used in other places commercially is used as, I think it's the fucking, it was the NBA theme or, you know, just weird spots. You can go on there and just kind of rent it out, buy it, put it in your stuff, license it, but you can go on that website and this is one of the good things, uh, you know, if you find the Killapalooza page, Killapalooza 15 for Saw on DoubleFeatureShow.com, you can go on there and find links to the actual uh, EMP site where you can find all this stuff, because otherwise it's impossible to fucking get to. But they have it available to stream, so you can go on there and listen to it. And some people have, have ripped this stream, but I mean, it's nearly impossible to find. It's low quality. There isn't a good place to get a hold of this score. And it's a shame because it's the last one before we start to get into a lot of the weird remixy stuff that'll, uh, that'll happen in the later movies. Um, before we bolt into the next one, I wanted to talk about the twisty end oh, that happens here too. Yeah. There's a lot of weird shit that goes on and it's all, it's so fast. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, this has become a staple. Clearly we need twisty ends reveals, uh, this kind of, it was him all along here. This is where we get a series of second ambulance drivers. Well, basically, what what happens toward the end of the film is you realize that the guy who you think is, new, I guess, new Jigsaw, right? Mm-hmm. Running the trap is actually in a trap himself. Sure. Waiting for another trap to spring and cause a third trap to right. explode D-Wall's head. Yeah, um, yeah, right. All the while, Hoffman, that character who was briefly in the third film, uh-huh. is the new bad guy. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so now we have someone even kind of preceding Amanda. Right. Or in addition to that camp of people, which uh, is okay because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're not here to see John. It's not John or Bust on these movies. And right. if it is for some people, that they bail after the first sure. view because in the scope of the entire franchise, it's clearly not about John. So this is their way to say, you know what, we're giving you another twist ending and you're just going to have to kind of suck it up and take these because that's how this operation is going to run. All right, I want to do something really quick. It's uh, This is a long show and we said we didn't want to cut it, um, but this is just going to wear everybody out. Uh, Stand up and stretch. We're going to have a little intermission. I just want people to take, I don't know, two minutes, pause this, and uh, make a snack or something. Eat a sandwich. Eat what was that sandwiches. show where we gave out the Frappuccino recipe? Do you I remember don't remember. that? That was, I want to say, one of the Takashi Mike kind of whatever shows. Uh, also, a good thing to do during that breather, we mentioned our, our Apple TV server thing. We're only asking a couple times a year, donate.doublefeatureshow.com. 
it would be so nice if by this time, next episode, we have enough money to pay for this Apple TV thing. I would be so excited about that. I'm really, this whole project has me kind of pumped about that. You and I should take a little intermission too. I just did. We haven't done that in a while. We used to uh, we used to record the show in kind of two halves and then watch that. That was a terrible idea for Awful. us. We'll watch the movies in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a throwback to the old days. Stand yeah. up and take a stretch between the recordings. So goddamn refreshed. All right, Saw 5. Saw There's, 5. Uh, I assume, some kind of terrible, terrible tra- uh, tagline. The to Saw this, 5 this tagline movie. is one of the dumbest taglines, but not because <laughs> of the tagline itself. Um, so Saw 5, the alternate yeah. title being... Strom versus Hoffman. Yeah, great. Um, is you won't believe how it ends. Or you, wow. In the end, all the pieces fit together. Oh, right, cuz there's a So, so. I don't want to knock Saw 5 because no, Saw 5 is really strong in yeah, one great. particular area, but nothing fucking happens in Saw 5. Saw 5 is a 90-minute tribute to how Strom died. Yeah, it, it really is, isn't it? The other half of the film is 45 minutes of retconning Hoffman <laughs> into right. the original Jigsaw story. Yeah, it's almost completely his backstory. It's amazing that they get away with that. Which is why I refer to Saw 5 as Hoffman versus Strom. Yeah, yeah. Because Strom knows it's Hoffman. And he's just chasing him down the entire time. Well, come on. We start with that opening kill featuring the, uh, what is it? The Vincent Price, Roger Corman infamous uh, pendulum yeah, swinging. That right? is pretty rad. Which is great because that's been picked up in a lot of different places since it was originally done. And we've never got to see exactly what it looks like when it does slice through somebody. Right. It gets me back into the kills a little bit as I was getting yeah, all sad panda about it earlier. That's another thing that I really like about this film is it's, the first time it's actually a really characteristic gauntlet as we've as we've so titled as you because, will title for the yeah. film i don't know what a gauntlet is is that a thing you wear on your arm uh no it's that thing that you could be a wizard a barbarian or an archer queen uh, yeah, back no, on nes you've totally lost me um it's five people who are all connected to a single horrible event uh uh-huh. and the trial the gauntlet is designed that they can all survive. Oh, sure, yeah, Gauntlet. No, I totally know what you mean. But instead, they're selfish, and they've all (laughs) killed a group of innocent people, so they end up killing each other to the point where they almost all have to die. Well, yeah, you get that fresh room of characters a la Saw 2. You get a survivor pack again, which is a great way to mix that up, because... You know, for as much as we say something like uh, nothing actually happens in this, moving the the chronology around or all just trying to add one single thing to the chronology, you get a pack of people, Julia Benz included, who are, uh, we get back to our human dynamic again. Right. And the thing that's different about this is it's the first time that you see Jigsaw pitting people against each other, at least ostensibly. He's actually not pitting them against each other. And... When we get later on in the the series, uh, the third, the 3D one, yeah, that is absolute pitting against each other, and all of them are awesome. Well, wouldn't you say that the the first movie was them pitted against each other? I mean, that was what he no, was trying to set up. Because I I I think that he tries to set it up, but I don't think it's a necessity. I don't think that because think I'm thinking of particularly the second trap with the pipes. Okay, um, where the bombs are in the corners of the room. Oh, sure. And they need to get the keys to fit the three different pipes, and there's four of them. Yeah. And he says directly in the tape, Sure. Three of you will survive. You have to choose, you know, who's going to survive. Yeah, right. And he's essentially saying, three of you choose who you're going to let die. Yeah, right, right. Um, It's the first time where it seems like Jigsaw is saying, you have to kill somebody. Sure. In order to survive this. Yeah, you're only getting out if somebody dies rather than there being some... Rather, he's not, you know, where the first movie, I guess, was him encouraging sure. one person to kill the other as a means of escape. Here, it really seems like, I mean, it's still a, a trick or whatever, but it's him going, okay, somebody's not leaving this room. You guys uh, yeah. figure out what you're going to do about that. You know, what I like about that is this has told me something about myself as a person, too, because my first reaction... Their very first test, I thought, can't we just 
pause for a second and evaluate if there is a way for one of us to not die in this operation. I mean, that's the first thing I thought is we could all work together through this. Obviously, I'm not one of those people. I'm not in the situation in the moment. But when we talk about what is your gut reaction to a circumstance like this, what does it teach you about yourself or whatever? I guess that's my my gut reaction is I kind of go, I mean, I don't know. What do, you, what do you do in that moment where you see that scene pop up? I, I don't know. Do you go, could we take turns or what? It, I mean, you have to have a plan in your head, man. There's yeah, something, I, I know you're playing something. I'm always mind. trying to figure out a way to beat the game. I will, yeah. How like, will I beat the game? And I don't mean beat the game as in win. I you mean, mean how to break it. How the, to break the, the game. Um, the, what is it? What's the thing in Star Trek? I don't know. What uh, are you talking about? The Kobayashi Maru. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. To uh, to get around the so-called impossible, right? right? Um, yeah, that's, man, spot on reference for that. No one knows what we're talking about. No, people know Star Trek. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about is the real <laughs> answer to that. Oh, God. Um, the other thing is, you know, we're not playing Cube again, but we're... Uh, uh, we're playing it as we demonstrate our fucking misunderstanding of survival of the fittest. Right. It's intervention time. I have had enough of movies and really everybody not fucking getting. It's a, you know, over time, species with, uh, let's say, advantageous mutations are more likely to pass on their genes. Or let's all hit each other with broomsticks. Yeah, thanks, Saw. That's yeah. what survival... Survival of the fittest doesn't mean... Who can done kill y'all the fastest? Right. It means that on a long enough timeline that there are certain advantages that may show up in one class, making them more fit. And thusly, they were sur- they will survive out because they will outnumber the old pack that will procreate less. Sure. That's actually what survival of the fittest means. I challenge you to find an example in any film ever where anybody gets that right. Yeah. And another thing that's that happens in Saw 5 that we absolutely cannot get too far into because of the following film in the Is franchise. It the characters and how I don't understand who any of them are. Well, it's 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 not that. It's that I I'll, like that they had the police scene, by the way, not to oh, totally yeah. cut you off here, but they honor the previous officers because at this point, it's a good recap even for myself. I have a hard time keeping any of these characters straight. Uh I'm used to slasher movies having new campers every movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? And this, uh, it's all of these overlapping characters that you didn't pay attention to because you didn't know they'd be important and now they're leading the film. You can't even remember what their fucking name is. So it's just honoring all the previous fallen officers as if to go, we're about to get into some crazy territory. Let's make sure we're all caught up (laughs) and that you have these people. These are the people that are dead. You don't need to know who they are, but just so you feel like you're not already 20 paces behind. Right. Here's everybody and their names and their pictures. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, going back to the people who are in the in the traps, it's the yeah. first time we get, what did you do wrong? I build condos. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, but, that's but, true. but before you go and say, hey, wait a second, that's not actually a bad thing. It turns out that the five of them together burned eight people alive. Yeah, that's true. So at the end of the day, they just didn't realize what they did wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> they just assumed. they fe- Apparently, Julie Benz felt bad that she built condos. She thought that that they was had bad enough into that, yeah. for Jigsaw to make her slice her hand open. Well, I mean, this is, you know, several days into the Saw incidents. So at this point, we've basically ridded the earth of all the bad people. Yeah. They're all, every last one of them. We killed all the things. And now we're just killing people of, uh, let's say, dubious moral integrity. Not even dubious. I mean, honestly, grants permits to people who might not deserve it. Sure. That's, that's the re- or knocks down projects so we can build nicer condos. But you're right, they do. Well, they, and if you want to talk about dubious moral integrity, here comes fucking Hoffman. <laughs> sure. Right? Yeah, let's get to the bottom of the, the big question because our B story characters, they all learn something at the end. Yeah. They hold hands, the two hands they still have left. And, you know, I think it's cool that we see all of those characters go through their own mini arc and kind of learn something about we well, shouldn't be so fucking selfish. It's just it's nice how that happens even after they slaughter themselves. Yeah, we're getting used to Saw going, oh, wait, you didn't learn anything and you're miserable and now you die. Uh, not with our main characters, but with our side characters. Right. So we do something different here. 
But uh, the bottom of the, the, the big question we want to get to is why is Hoffman such a fucking dick? Yeah, the thing about Hoffman is that, and it's going back to the pendulum trap. Mm-hmm. Hoffman faked a jigsaw kill to get revenge. <laughs> yeah, right. And then jigsaw Could takes cover, him under you know. his wing. Yeah. But Hoffman throughout and to the end of the franchise is probably just a bad guy. Yeah. The, it, it's in, uh, I think it's in this film where they're setting up the, uh, the, the rack trap from the third film yeah, yeah. and Hoffman dumps the guy out of the wheelbarrow. Sure. And John says, that's a human being there. Yeah. And Hoffman says, you want to watch him get yeah, tortured right, just right. as much as I do. And it's this, this disparity between John who at the very marrow of his bones cancer ridden as they may have been sure felt like what he was doing was essentially for the betterment of the individuals and the overall betterment of society sure hoffman likes to fuck with people there is something about the time maybe it's just the the ben's uh thing that's had she's in the movie and so i'm thinking about dexter yeah but this is right about the time dexter's hitting it big right yeah. somewhere around this sure. year Um, or at least certainly in the years to follow. And people are, you know, now the kind of things we might compare this franchise to aren't things that came before it, but things that are also becoming very popular. Dexter is a show where we have a a kind of righteous killer taking the law into his own hands. Certainly not a new premise. By vigilantism, I mean, come on. We've covered movies back from the 60s and 70s about that stuff. But uh, doing it in a style where... And I guess I'm I'm thinking about it in this movie because we have the fake kill and that's kind of a Dexter thing that shows up every once in a while, somebody masquerading as another killer right. or whatever. There's a couple of Dexter tie-ins that we've kind of gotten up to this point. There is something to that, something to an audience wanting to show up and see people pay. That's just sure. kind of what's in with horror at this time. It's uh something that, you know, Bowsman's group worked on, but this is, um, I think his name is David Hackle. Yeah. The, uh, the guy who directed this movie. He's the middle guy. Yeah, he's kind of the one-off. He just had this film. But he was doing second unit for mm-hmm. Bosman's movies. He did, um, he did the second unit directing on all the Bosman stuff for uh, Saw, anyways. But he also did the set design uh, and that for Repo. So he's worked on a lot of that stuff with Bosman before, worked on a lot of the Saw stuff. And then he's coming in to, to direct this one. It's, uh, it's a hard position for him to be in to tell this particular story because it's an even harder sell for a movie to say that there was someone, you know, we had Amanda. We had the, there was actually someone helping him before the right. Michael Emerson character, before Zepp was helping him uh, or during when Zepp was helping him. But now we have the harder sell for the movie to say there was someone helping him before the last fucking person we just did this with. It might be difficult to remember as you were talking about, but John has been sick as long as we've known him. Yep. I mean, uh, the first real tape we get has him coughing on it. It's one of the th- the first things we learn about the killer at all. The very first time we even see John, he's what? He's in a hospital yeah. bed, right? So he's a very sick man. And as they say, he's an engineer. He's not the muscle. So it makes sense sure. that we have this other guy around. And um, it allows the dynamic of who the killer is and what he wants to change over time. Well, and it also kind of toys with this idea of um, it's a, it's kind of a miscreant version of utopia. You mm-hmm. have this idea and it's perfect and pure. And I mean, you know, it's fucked up because there's murder involved. Yeah, right. But you have this perfect, pure idea that is 100% for a positive change. Yeah. And... Then it they gets into somebody good. else's hands and they think, well, but this particular person didn't deserve to be reformed. Sure. And then it lands in Hoffman's hands and he doesn't even really grasp the idea. He likes doing fucked up things. A little bit of, um, what is it? Ultimate power corrupts. Absolutely. Yeah. Something yeah. to that. Absolute effect. power, uh, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so- a little bit like that and a little bit like telephone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I think you're spot on with that. I mentioned uh, the remix stuff quite a bit before. So, um, in this movie, uh, Clauser did the score. He's still doing the score every time, and it's an original score. But it's only maybe three fourths of it that's 
newly written for this film. Mm. A good portion of it is remixes of stuff that he's done or alternate versions, um, reworking tracks from the previous two movies, and starting to use a lot of the cues in the music, a lot of the sound design in the music. So it was another one of the unreleased scores, but it's also a score that not a lot of the material is new off of it. It's actually, hey, we've had the same guy scoring a lot of the previous movies. Let's literally just take tracks from those movies and use them again. And we'll see that in the next Saw, which is Saw number six. Now, when we're talking about Saw six for Clauser, I mean, that was his most recycled score yet. It was, uh, he was working on Stepfather at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, probably a couple other music projects, too, although it's a lot easier to kind of look up his filmography than figure out what albums he was engineering at the time. But for whatever reason, in this tiny block of films, specifically the fifth and now the sixth one, uh, he's just working on so many other things, I guess he doesn't have time for it. So he does this score, and I mean, the stuff that is new to this score, even more recycled than the, the stuff from the fifth score, but the stuff that is new is great it's this kind of the song flesh is a good example pretty early in the movie it's a driving just banging heavy fucking machine track that's probably oh, the one, one that my, goes on during that first scene the pound yeah, of flesh right uh with the scream queens chick. yeah absolutely and then leads over into a bit of uh of the next scene so the tag there's again there's two taglines uh this is the game comes full circle or great. trust in him and now here's why Hmm. Here's why I I wrote both down, even though one was clearly the actual tagline. <laughs> okay, which I one wrote was down that? trust in him because uh-huh. this is the one where Jigsaw gets fucking preachy, and it the oh, whole yeah, movie you got really mad because the whole movie <laughs> seems to be going. Look, Jigsaw's got a point today. Yeah, today right. Jigsaw's making a point, but it's the wrong point. But before before we get into the politics and the uh, ethics of the twisted disgusting world that is insurance yeah which the movie is just begging us to talk about right it it would love to have a dialogue about that i want to talk about james gunn yeah james gunn wait what so (laughs) um in the uh the summer before saw six came out Mm -hmm. there was a show on vh1 called scream queens Okay, and I don't know if anybody watched it. It was really short lived. So what is six this? episodes? It Scream was a combination Queens. of it's like a reality TV thing. It was reality TV slash game show. It was kind of a mix of The Bachelor and Fear Factor. Okay. Um, the show when they began, they had maybe ten to twelve different girls uh-huh. who were all trying out to be the next Scream Queen. They were going to have a role in the new Saw movie, and they had three judges slash coaches and there was you know their acting coach and their screaming coach and then james gunn was just a director who would come up with scenes torture these girls and make them act through scary shit oh beautiful um the one scene that i always remember is he has the these two girls he would pair them up and they would memorize their lines and they would get in a tent and they would have a cute you know sexy hot slasher style slumber party and then cockroaches. They would dump <laughs> sure. hundreds sure. and hundreds of cockroaches. And these girls had to act scared, but also still stick their lines and nail all their blocking. Yeah. Cockroaches um, is perfect because that's such... I mean, that was Fear Factor, right? right. That's the... When uh, Joe Rogan isn't being a nut and going on about a moon hoax or yeah, getting... Or uh, the world being a paramecium. Uh, smacked down by Phil Plate. Uh, I think Penn and Teller were on uh, Fear Factor, yeah. and they're famous for all their cockroach bits. So this was kind of a reality TV game show thing where they were trying to find, I suppose, the next Scream Queen, or right. they were going to guarantee placement in a film for a Scream Queen. And the winner was uh, the girl who cut off her arm sure, in yeah. the Pound of Flesh Who just gets intro. better and better oh, in this she movie. she is such a great role. Yeah. She's the she's the first person to stand up and go, how the fuck am I supposed to learn from this? <laughs> sure, my yeah. arm is missing. Yeah, right. Fuck you. Yeah, that's my uh, my favorite scene that she does. I think she's fantastic in that. But now, okay, I, I, I know this film does deal a lot with the healthcare issue. <laughs> well, holy crap, do we have a zeitgeist film. I mean, if you ever wanted to talk about the horror zeitgeist and what's going on and what draws people to cinema and what is it talking about, this film dates itself so much to a specific time and place. 
is talking about the issues that it elects to speak of are the housing crisis and the evil people that caused that, right, by loaning out more, uh, yeah. what was that, the subprime mortgage one? The idea right. that sure. you borrowed way more money to people than they could possibly afford. Right. Because as a lender, you're a salesperson and you have a quota to meet. And all that's probably true, but what the who cares what I think about that? I don't know anything yep. about mortgage lending housing bubble i can't even, i don't even know the name of the fucking thing we're talking about so it touches on that a little bit in a pretty obvious way but it also talks about healthcare quite a bit it's got this view of healthcare that's based off john's own senile alarmist view yeah. of the uh kind of the lefty view of the healthcare industry it just i mean man it makes me nuts and i'd let it go but the movie refuses to yeah it really sure. it's dying to it's kind of you know when someone starts that conversation with you and you clearly, I don't know if you find yourself in this position as often as I do, but I'll enter into a lot of conversations with people I just have to interface with for whatever reason, where they'll bring up something, and in my head I'll go, oh, don't, just don't go, don't go into this. Um, someone brought up 9-11 conspiracies the other day, and how you just read the facts, and it'll all become obvious. And at the time and place we were in, I uh, I had to, I was working on a project with this particular individual and we were working on something fairly challenging. And so I was thinking, wrong time to do this, yeah. wrong time to do this. But I couldn't help myself because it's not the truth. It's, it's sure. fucking misinformation. So I had to get into it. And so that's how I feel about this movie. I'm like, oh man, I'm enjoying a good stretch. Don't talk to me about how the healthcare industry is full of villains who are sentencing people to death. Because whether you are for, against, or think that false dichotomies of two sure. things are stupid regarding the healthcare industry. Or uh, whether or not you can choose to live or die. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the clue there is that false dichotomies, that's the, that's the one that's, that's the big thumbs up, is uh, it's not all or nothing. But I, I just kept thinking, movie, don't, come on, movie. Yeah. Don't, we don't have to go down this path. We don't have to talk about this. Um, it's not about is healthcare a good idea or bad idea or whatever, because there's, you know, there's opinions you could have on that, Sure, but the movie just keeps going. People who work in the healthcare industry are, it's kind of like the view that a lot of people share on lawyers that they're all evil. Yeah. They're the worst kind of person. What's they're sentencing people to death. What's really bizarre about this movie Uh is that it could juxtapose jigsaw against the health insurance people (laughs) it could go look jigsaw kills people by forcing them into situations where they can't possibly get out of healthcare people force you know even if it did that yeah i see what you're saying that's making a point but instead it uses the saw mechanic to make the health insurance guy (laughs) kill people yeah it's just going here's an example of what you are actually doing you're killing this person. Sure. You're killing these people. But it does have one of my favorite traps, which is the fucking carousel. Yeah. That's um that's one of the most iconic things I think from the franchise. There's a poster with the carousel yeah. on it and uh and it goes on. I mean, the um God, that uh that trap is it's almost miserable again because of how long it goes on and how much you start to feel for those sure. people. I mean, this gets back into the kind of misery that the movie is clearly aiming for yeah. of just, um, you know, you at that point you want to feel the doctor's suffering. You're supposed to, it's, it's a strange mechanic because Jigsaw is a villain, but yeah. also the doctor is a villain. Sure. The thing, so if I didn't explain this very well, just the, the thing that kind of made me crazy about it is you have uh, an insurance company and the idea is that people sign up for insurance and while there's a lot of nonsense that goes around in the insurance industry and yeah. that there needs to be a lot of reform. Well, as with any business. The basic premise is that it's a business. You pay them for insurance. Like you pay for a warranty to fucking anything. And uh, you pay in a little bit every paycheck or every month or whatever. And then when you get sick or something bad happens to you, they have, they're a giant place with a bunch of fucking money and they give it to you and you get your operation. So there's a very cynical portrayal of that industry, and there's a lot of bad that goes on in that industry. But the movie kind of treats the industry like it's their job, it's their civic duty to save everything. Right. <laughs> like it's not a business. 
uh, that you signed up for electively or have a choice in going to another one for. Yeah. Instead, it's a place that robbed you by force of all your money and then decided that uh, you were too big of a risk, so it's not going to pay for your operation, and then just sentenced you to death. Well, and it makes it easy to hate them because they keep referring to the formula, yeah, which right. is just an easy way for them to write off the actual company policy. Yeah. I mean, that uh, place wouldn't exist as a business if they didn't have some kind... You know, to just keep going back to that formula, like, oh, God, I don't know. I'm sorry. I won't get into a big thing about it. I just don't like the the portrayal as evil human beings whose sole purpose is to discount human life uh, in order to make a bottom dollar profit because that's such a oversimple like anything if you oversimplify it you come out looking like a complete moron who doesn't know what they're talking about but so we have an evil doctor we do we- who's right next to uh our evil jigsaw but i like your way of looking at it that's what uh, what allows me to kind of put a spin on this movie that i enjoy is that you have him cast in everyone's mind, or at least in John's mind, as here's the evil guy who makes choices about whether or not people live or die in order to save money. And then when you have him put in a situation where he has to actually fucking execute people, the movie's probably trying to go, yeah, this is just a a real-world version of the the trigger he's pulling each and every day where he doesn't have to clean up the mess. But in my mind, I watch this and I go, look how much different this is than him yeah. sitting in an office going, I'm sorry, you don't meet the quota that you fucking signed sure. up for when you got this insurance policy. Yeah. So, you know, I find that way of, and obviously I'm just making it up on my own, but it's that way of making me respect the movie again Yeah. and kind of go, oh yeah, you're saying these are two very different things when you have people on a fucking carousel, you're pointing guns in their mouths. Well, and then there's the other aspect of the movie, which again, these Saw movies are so dense that you forget that there's second and third layers. Sure. This is sure. the movie where Jill tries to kill Hoffman. Oh yeah, there's that This too. is the movie where you find out that it's in john's dying will to have yeah. hoffman offed and taken care of oh yeah we're still doing crazy flashback stuff we're relating current events to previous sure. events they're getting real good at that and this is the one where they put hoffman in the reverse bear trap and he rips yeah. his mouth open but he manages to get away and you're just sitting there wondering why they ever even use the reverse bear trap because it sure. really doesn't seem to be an effective it just killing never, tool. Yeah, never quite works, but it looks so good on their head. It's um, man, going back through and doing those little backstories. This is another great advantage of the year after year films is that you don't have to do, you know, when we think of any other franchise where we go back and we do a flashback. We have to really play some games, makeup-wise, effect-wise, in order to go back and sell it. The kind of things where, you know, we did, um, fuck, what was the movie, Uh, the ice cream thing, has the temporal gates. Whoa, what? Phantasm. Yes. Yeah, where it starts to get really weird, and then they try and go back and, like, retcon stuff and use all their footage and all this weird stuff. And they do a good job there for total separate reasons we don't need to discuss now, we discuss then. But a lot of times when you try and match up, okay, it was 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, match up the makeup, get the actors back, do all this crazy stuff, Saw never has to worry about that. These come out year after year. Yeah. That's it. Everybody and looks so the same. if you want to make your actor look like they were in a scene from three years ago, it's really not that hard. Especially with the the Bowsman RepoVision yeah. uh, filter, the, sure. the kind of blown out soft focus highlight thing it becomes very very easy to make it look seamless like the characters were there all the time and to do all this crazy flashback stuff so you totally believe that the uh the person who's bringing that through to this movie is the new director Mm -hmm. uh the director of the last two films kevin what was his last name again uh grudert God, I have it written in front of me. I just the, can't you already me- we already it. mentioned him as the editor for the previous five films. Yeah, he did those films. He also did, um, you know, one I forgot to mention, Jeremy Casson, longtime oh, listener man. of the show. Longtime listener, every time caller, I think. Um, he got his start as an editor and edited a lot of his own films. He did, we talked about him a lot on the Attic Expeditions. Yeah, Wizard did of the Gore. Wizard of Gore. He did a movie called The Thirst that um that kevin actually did the editing for which was uh 
pretty amazing to see all these obscure movies kind of in his back catalog and Kevin's back catalog and then go, oh yeah, Jeremy Kasten's The Thirst. That's, huh. how about that? Small fucking world. But he didn't edit, uh, Kevin didn't edit this movie. This is where he actually stepped away from editing and then started doing the directing. And, you know, I, I bring his name up because where a lot of the rationale for the story fails and you get Jigsaw, like, monologuing and the insurance yeah. claims office and all this ridiculous shit, the traps more than make up oh, for yeah. it. I mean, you mentioned the carousel thing and the, the failed bear trap. The one that I think is uh, one of the greatest is that steam trap. The steam maze. Yeah, and you know, I don't like it just so much for the the fact it is a steam maze and it's, you know, that fucking modern warfare level or whatever. But it's the the push pull relationship that we usually get between a couple characters. Here we have in a teamwork fashion. It's these two characters trying to help one another. A redeeming moment for our insurance claims agent sure. uh, to be sure, but you know, at the end obviously we get a bit of a turn on that. Before that moment, instead of going, you have to lose so that I can win, both of their immediate reaction is, oh, I'll help you so you'll help me. Wait, do you do you want to do it the other? Yeah. Oh, we're both people. We're both real life human sure. beings. We have to get out of this. How about I endure a little pain so you can endure a little pain and let's go for this. And then the fact they get to the end and rather than, it's kind of the flip side of what they usually do or uh, not every time, but sometimes what they'll do is two people compete against each other. And then ultimately team up. We just saw that. Um, we'll see that again, you know, in the next film. Uh, instead, we have two people who team up, get to the end, and then one gets some new information and goes, whoa, fuck that guy. I have to do this to sure. live. Which is the exciting climactic spot you want to end in. But I think the much more believable kind of, you and I have talked about, you know, being pacifists. The one time we may be able to commit harm, maybe not even then, is to save ourselves. Sure. So it's so believable and, and really endearing to see these two people work together to get through this maze, get to the end, and one has to make that emergency split-second decision of, okay, you've gotten to the end, you need a key, it's inside that guy's torso. Yeah. And she goes, fuck this, I don't have time, get yeah. me inside your torso. And he even kind of talks her out of it, and then she explodes. The other, uh, the other thing I love is the um you've talked about this briefly but we haven't really mentioned this in the franchise yet <laughs> there is literally a live or die switch oh, which yeah. is it, it this is my favorite because it's not a fucking trap it's just a switch, switch that says live and, or die and i say favorite in a way again that kind of makes me nuts it's just um so they have a switch on the wall they can choose to throw it and they kill the subject now before we really uh pull this one apart uh, so to speak, I want to, um, what is usually the choice that people are faced with in this movie? Break this choice uh, down for me. The choice, the choice that, uh, that this Jake is saw, so funny to me because this is always what happens. essentially faces people with is I'll just do a hypothetical. Sure. Uh, hi, hi, Eric. I, I want you to play a game. Uh, I'm sorry. I have to modulate your voice. So it's down an octave. We'll, we'll try this again. This movie uses the, it has the audio version of the CSI photo enhance. Uh huh. But the opposite, where in CSI, it's always, oh, click enhance and it looks easy, but in reality, it's hard, near impossible, sure. getting better. This movie has, oh, the audio, it, it makes their voice so crazy, we can't get through it. You know, they, they have all this advanced software, and all they're doing is lowering the pitch, and they're not even doing it that well. Sometimes it warps in and out. The crazy software you need in order to do this is called GarageBand, and it comes for free on your fucking computer. <laughs> the crazy plugin they need is pitch shifter i mean a child could use it yeah. you open it and you go pitch goes down and you pull a lever <laughs> so uh if you want to try that again and i'll just knock you yeah, down an sure. octave here eric i want to play a game uh -huh. yeah a game go et on etc 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 okay good <laughs> then then it's always something very eloquently stated something along the lines of poetic you are now faced with the choice to capitalize on a situation that was once left alone to you will you execute the man who executed your dreams the way your father did when you were a four-year-old mm, good choice or what's the other what's the other choice or not <laughs> oh i'm the sorry the choice so, is yours <laughs> so on the on the one hand i could uh i could murder this man uh in in this trap like uh scenario or uh, what's what's plan b leave oh i could just i could just bail 
I could just take off. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Even, okay, so the, the thing I'm about to arrive to is this thing where no one needs to die. It's just arbitrary. But before that, even in a trap where it's you versus the other guy, let's take that most typical example we don't even really see a lot in the uh-huh. franchise, just you versus another man. It's always stated as this big poetic thing. You could choose to kill him or, you know, don't choose that. That's okay. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is it a disappointed way? Like, clearly, you know which one sure. he wants you to yeah, pick. Yeah, it's a loaded question. <laughs> it's this big elaborate. Hey, you could pick this surprising thing in this beautiful box. What's behind this door number one over here? Or, uh, I don't know, door B, probably a mule or something. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, in the live or uh, live or die switch, it's just, hey, this man killed your, you think it, that's the big insurance right. fucking thing coming back that I hate. Um, this man sentenced your husband, your father, to death. Um, so your choice here is you can flip the switch and kill him, or not flip the switch and don't kill him. I it, maybe maybe I'm boiling this down too much, but their own survival does not seem dependent yeah. on whether or not they flip the switch. So they just have the decision on whether to flip the switch. It's presented to them as a decision, but this isn't a real choice. This isn't yeah. an opportunity for them. This is a choice you literally have every second of your life. Uh, there's no reason not to let him live. We're in a position right now where I'm sitting across from you in our studio. We're podcasting. Now, you have the choice. I could just kill you right now. To kill me or to not. Right. And when we're done podcasting, you'll have the choice to, to kill, kill me then. or to not. I'm basically, the, the, the option is always just kill or don't do it right Right. so when they were in the claims office and you know their father was sentenced to death uh they could have taken out a gun and shot him they didn't need jigsaw to make that choice it turns out you can kill anyone at any time that is always a choice you have and thankfully most people make the decision not to every second of the day for their entire lives that shows what a great species we are that we don't just wander around raping and killing everyone but Jigsaw presents this, and by merely stating the question, suddenly they go, oh, a unique opportunity. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. As if they couldn't just do that. They could right. let him wander free. Everyone could get outside. The FBI could come and, of course, put the, the warm blanket on you that, you know, when you're rescued from sure. a situation like this, you need. And put him in the ambulance and then kill him. I guess maybe they get off scot-free because it looks like a jigsaw, a jigsaw puzzle. Thing. They can just make an excuse for it. but. That's just getting away with murder. It's still murder. They don't have the clear conscious of it was me or him. Right. Which is just evil. I mean, aside from painting, you know, the other people to look evil, the fact the movie kind of goes, yeah, didn't he deserve it? He sentenced him to die. It's that tying together of the the stupid switch right. idea and the health insurance idea. It's just so fucking evil. Um, so Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan are obviously still writing for it. They're, uh, you can see the progress of their you know, shoehorning political issues and so forth. In, but they're also paying off a lot of things they set up in the previous films. It's what starts to make the Saw franchise look a lot, feel a lot, more like serialized television. Yep, exactly. Which had really hit full stride by this time. You know, we were talking about Dexter or whatever. But uh, at this point, you know, we mentioned Lost earlier. Um, the first Saw kind of coming before Michael mm-hmm. Emerson's big thing on Lost. But uh, lost around that time and Heroes and then, um, you know, all that Abrams stuff coming out and Flash Forward and all of these shows that kind of had an element of mystery, but then some kind of canon to them. Right. Uh, Even shows like The Office around that time were starting to develop. You have to see every episode. Every fucking show on TV had previously on this show because you have to watch every episode. People want serialized television. Due to, in part, I think, the proliferation of things like the DVR and Hulu and Apple TV and Netflix, where you mm-hmm. could watch. People weren't just tuning into cable and seeing whatever's on. Now we're watching. And we sit down. We have a show we're working through. Sure. We watch every single episode of the show. This is just another great thing about Saw, is that they realize we have a movie coming out every year. Of course, we're going to make another one of these movies next year. Let's pay everything forward. Let's just keep building up little things that we can then pay off next time. They're cooked right into the plot of the movie. They're cooked right into, you know, the the kind of, it's almost their own C story. There's an A story, which is Jigsaw and Canon. 
There's a B story, which is survivor pack or survivor person or whatever that's only tangentially related or tied in at the end. And there's a C story of, not even a story, but a collection of bizarre scenes that we will bring up later and make a huge deal out of them. Yep. As if these last couple movies, the last three or four Saw movies, it's not just Saw 4, 5, 6, 7. It's like Saw 4, Part 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right. You know, we're really planning to do more of these. For a movie that ends in a in a fairly neat but um, uh, wanting more place of that trap that right. kind of sure. he gets out of. He breaks it. We never really see anybody successfully break that. I mean, I guess we do a little yeah. bit. There's always repercussions to breaking the traps. Yeah. He's. Uh, it was such a triumphant moment for me to see somebody just go, well, fuck this. I'm not going to die in this. I'm going to... Bu- yeah. I like that idea like you do of, well, how do I break the trap? Yeah. I'm going to bend it on these bars or something. And the way they shoot, you know, all the doors close in that little door closing montage yeah. of, hey, look, look at all the scenes we've compiled. And then just that jaw agape yelling up at the sky. It's a pretty boss shot to just title card end. And then the last one, and it's almost bittersweet. I'm sad we're at the end, but God, I love the seventh Saw movie. The seventh Saw movie entitled Saw the Final Chapter, not Saw 7. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what? <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, what? It's called Saw the Final Chapter, or I would I also... I was just uh, taking a drink of my water. You mean the... I would uh, also accept Saw 3D. The seventh Saw movie, the... Uh, how could the tagline just be 3D? That oh, that's not the sense. tagline. How could the tagline just be the final chapter? That's I don't. not the tagline either. What do you? So the movie's called Saw Seven. No, it's none of you're, those. You're breaking my case. heart. I'm what sorry, but I like this movie so much. It's How could so it do good. me wrong? I don't know. The first Saw one through six are called Saw one through six. They all use Roman numerals, same font. What did? What are you bringing me here? It's called Saw the Final Chapter, which. If I'm sorry. It is... There was an alternate though. There was an alternate. Let's get rid. Saw the Final Chapter sucks. What was the other? I didn't, you said that and I didn't even hear the alternate. Give me the other one. Saw 3D. No, no, let's go back. <laughs> let's go back to Saw the final chip. Wow. All right, that's fine. It's called Saw 7. That's what I'm going to call okay. it. Like I do every other. Let's revert to plan B, which is ignore the actual title. Call it the name of the movie with the number. Okay, sounds good. I don't know how I ever made it through Friday the 13th. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, this is the last one and it gives it a last little title and yeah. it's in 3D apparently. It is in 3D. Uh, it's, but in, that's the... it's in eye-popping 3D. Oh my it's God. in mind-blowing 3D. Oh, good. It's in... These are very, very oh, violent. Eye-popping, mind-blowing, and I didn't write down the third one, but it was in three different types of 3D. Heart-pounding 3D. Thank you. That's, I just made that up. I don't know. It was that's... heart-pounding, but there was also the uh, tagline of the traps come alive. The trap, right, because it's in 3D. Right. This is a movie by William Castle. So you Remember talk- William Castle, <laughs> by the way? You talk- That's the only uh, mistake this movie makes, is the title. Everything else, I want to go on record, yeah. everything else about this movie That's is true. brilliant and beautiful, and me and Saw 7 are getting along so much better. There's just, I mean, uh, we have uh, this opening kill where we have actual choice. It's not the fake right. choice we were talking about. Someone we're seeing in the moment is manipulating other people for, for evil purposes that's you know going to be punished for it, even on the spot during the trap. It's great. And you talked in, uh, in the last film about how they leave these open-ended things. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I find so bizarre and so fantastic about the last Saw movie yeah. is that after Saw, the first film, you never see... Dr. Lawrence Gordon again. Right. Until the last film. They're clearly waiting to pull that back out. Yeah, right. They could have blown their load on that way back. Yeah, Saw four. Could've. Sure. But instead they wait and go, that guy who went through hell. Sure. He comes back. You in... forget he's alive. That's what you want. You have yeah. so many fucking characters. You forget that that guy exists. He comes back in such a fucking fantastic way. I mean, he slow claps. Yeah. <laughs> he comes back. He comes back for Sitting the final. Sitting over by the donut table. That's where you want to be. Yeah. He comes back uh, for the final triple done got pigged. Yeah, it's true. I it's mean, true. he is he is cleaning up house for everything that uh, everything else that's going on here. Yeah. He comes back. Uh, he makes his uh, appearance to the characters in that survivor circle, you know, where we get uh, Cindy's new storytelling. Sure. 
Um, Cindy is just some new character. She had, turns out, an uh, interaction with Jigsaw that we flash back to. Yeah. It's, uh, man, I love the, uh, the idea of Jigsaw's untold tales. Right. That we have to remember. So for all the craziness that's happening, um, and, you know, how we start to think about, at this point, Hoffman has been Jigsaw longer than anybody else. That's only to us. The Jigsaw killings were happening. I mean, it's something they talked about in the first movie. People have heard of this. Yeah. This is a thing that has been going on. These movies, I don't want anybody to like take us to task for this because it's probably not true. But I'm going to make the assumption this whole series happens over the scope of like four days. Yeah, I think... It really doesn't... There's a gap between the first and second, to be sure. But really, the rest of the movies could all kind of happen the same week, couldn't yeah. they? Yeah, I mean, with the exception of D. Wall's beard in the fourth movie, that's <laughs> sure. the only okay. yeah, chronological no, right. I knew there would be a hole in this somewhere. Damn it. But Saw, the fi- I almost called it Saw 7, fuck. Saw the final chapter. <laughs> I'm going to win you over on this. Stars Sean Patrick Flannery, who we've seen in Boondock Saints. Yeah, right. Um, but he plays this role that I have been dying to see since the second Saw movie which is some dick who's capitalizing, pretending sure. he survived a jigsaw puzzle. Well, he's pretending he's part of the Untold Tales. Yeah. So he says this thing, and that's kind of our first glimpse into Untold Tales, is, oh, wait, we I don't, hold on a second, I don't remember this. There are a lot of characters. The movie had me fooled. Sure. I just went, oh, I guess I forgot about him because there's so many people to keep sure. track of. I didn't write his name down. But um, he would be the first Untold Tale, and he is full of it. He didn't go through this experience at all, whereas Cindy did, and they show us what happened right. to Cindy, and that kind of makes her the the shadows of the empire to this franchise. She's the little thing that fell between the cracks of the other stories, and man, do I, I totally dig the idea. Great idea, Eighth Saw film is just, or we could start doing the, uh, the trick-or-treat web yep. series type of thing, just... Little one-off things Jigsaw did on this and that day in history that nobody ever talked about. So he's full of it. He didn't actually go through this. And um, man, I really dig this because it's it still has that Melton Dunstan bigger purpose feel to it. We're sure. still doing some kind of... Uh, I would do him a disservice by calling it activism, but you know what I mean. They're putting their idea. It's something I encourage people to do. Sure. Put your ideas into your movie no matter how vehemently your audience may disagree with them, that's how we have a marketplace of ideas. That is good. Um, That's a good thing. But this time, they're taking their aim at the self-help industry, Mm -hmm. at this kind of Oprah book club thing, which is fucking evil. Not like insurance companies that are not actually evil, but just not done very well. Uh, Oprah book club is actually the ultimate evil. The fucking secret was on there. We did a whole show with Rebecca goddamn Watson on The Secret and Theodore Rex, which wasn't actually that (laughs) evil, uh, just about this kind of stuff. So now they're taking their aim at that, and they're also talking about these kind of change-your-life type events. Mm -hmm. So they're doing two things simultaneously. Uh, They are tearing down uh, an industry of charlatans or showing, exposing a single fraud in the self-help kind of movement you know, that, uh, who was that guy that did a million little pieces, whatever, South Park lampooned it. That's all you yeah, need to that know guy. is that Tali did it a million fibers or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of, uh, happening. And so I think this is kind of a jab at that. But while they're tearing that down, they're building up. Well, the idea kind of makes sense. Just like with the secret, oh, positive thinking can't be that bad of a thing. Sure. But this particular instance is fraudulent. They're saying life changing events, not a bad idea. But this guy is full of it. He's just totally making this stuff up. Right. But all these other people, I mean, is there something to the idea that these events might be good for people? Let's raise that question. And for a, a premise that I thought was so evil before, it's so great and refreshing for me for these two writers to then come around with what is the total opposite. <clears throat> you know, the total opposite, the the best fucking thing ever, this well, life-changing events kind of uh, invoking this question and tearing down a fraud. I love that. So there's a handful of reasons that Saw 7 is best goddamn thing ever. Totally digging it. But we also have uh, Ass Kick and Clouser back is uh, in full force, really. Um, there's, you know, straight from the beginning. I mean, this score is, it feels the most like the first score, I think. 
It is, uh, it's more modern, it's tighter, it's more grindy, but it gets back to a lot of that re-trigger stuff and does away with a lot of the softer bells and so forth that, you know, those motifs are still around mm-hmm. in the music, but it's a lot more rock. It's a lot more heavy and just tight and metal and, um, and doesn't have any of the remix or the cue stuff. It's full on. You can tell these are compositions and the score got released too. You know, you can get it. It's awesome. You can uh, buy the fucking thing. You can get, I think it's a two disc album or whatever. There's a ton of it and it's great. And it's one of the many, many ways that I think that Saw 7 ended the series correctly. You already mentioned Lawrence. Sure. Um, we're getting characters coming back. We're ending on a high note. We're getting the kills coming back. Oh my God. Are we ever fucking getting the kills coming back? Do you remember the fish hook trap? Yeah, yeah. So, geez, <laughs> that's not even. Um, we got this fish hook thing is for me. It's the most uh, notable thing. Oh yeah, it's, the cameos are notable because there's sure. a very uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street kind of bringing yeah. back a lot of these actors and people are coming back through the woodwork too. I mean, I can't. I feel so lame because I can't even remember who the fuck everybody uh-huh. is. You're great about this. You're going. Hey, there's that person. You remember this obscure person from yeah. that the survivor circle has everybody in yeah. it. And I just feel like uh, I'm going senile. I cannot remember anybody. But that's not uh, for you and I the most notable thing. The most notable thing is the silent this, fish hook. The fucking fish hook trap is of everything in this movie. Of everything in this franchise. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. Of the franchise and. Really, maybe even the collection of Lionsgate stuff yeah. on the show. This is uh, one of our greatest struggles, uh, if not the franchise, of, of all double featured them with any kill. You and I have kind of, uh, we've, we've been a little sad about how desensitized we've sure. come to the extreme violence. And even as we work through our, our Asia Rocky stuff and that stuff starts to get really weird and extreme, um, you know, we'll, we'll end up getting into that and seeing how we do with that stuff but for the most part we have to go to this this american splat pack stuff in order to get violence that really and a lot of times we're more about the ideas there yeah we like old school american horror but it doesn't necessarily make us squirm no as much as it does most people well and the thing that's fucking bizarre about this trap is they tell you what's going on right yeah they say there's a fish hook with a key down in her stomach. Sure. If she screams... They show you an x-ray. Yeah. And if she screams, her throat's going to get pierced. Yeah, right. They explain that to you. The then execution of that... I'm sorry. Uh, is <laughs> Do it. The, the then... Uh, the way they play that out is they have her put a string in her mouth and he uh-huh. pretends it's hard to pull it out. And we uh. sit there trying to puke the fish hook out of our own oh my body God. because it's oh it's one of i the think most... i heard your pizza come up yeah. as we were you gag on that a little bit i mean my stomach felt knotted in a way that uh if you've ever been dry heaving for a couple yeah. minutes um i don't know if you get quite the same feeling from vomit i don't i'm not a vomity person so it's i i don't drink right so yeah. i don't have the experience of vomiting a lot but uh, if you've dry heaved to the point that you've been maybe trying to throw up, say you've been poisoned or something, I get poisoned a lot, but <laughs> I don't uh, often do drugs or alcohol uh, ever. Your stomach will start to feel like you've been doing crunches or something, yep. you know, like it's been flexing this muscle inside. That's literally how I felt watching this, as if um, as if my body's been trying to throw up. It just knotted up, probably because the clenched position i was sitting in and i mean you know me when stuff like this happens it doesn't happen a lot but i have a tendency to kind of scream and flail at the television and uh man there was an embarrassing amount of me squealing and telling the movie to knock that the fuck off and that's really weird juxtaposed against something as fucking blatantly gory as the fight the final reverse bear trap kill yeah when yeah, jill final. dies her face splits open sure it's one of the most gory things in the entire fucking franchise and we're like Haha, whoa that was crazy <laughs> yeah right well that's one of the things the movie does is it uh you know it's kind of gets me back into fun killing mode yeah but then it brings up something like the fish hook trap 
And that's when it really, uh, that's when I think it hits one of its best moments uh, of the whole franchise because I'm back in fun kill mode, but I'm also, we're, we've elevated this into we're doing something. We're evoking a an emotion in the audience that at least for me, and is true of you as well, so that seems like a, it's not a, a huge sample, but it's the only host of this show. Yep. Um, it does a great job of, hey, fun kills and all that good stuff. We're not going to get deep or dark or heavy with this, but we are going to do the best job of these goddamn kills, of this kill in particular, invoking a feeling in the audience that you can't get nearly anywhere else. So the question here, uh, we need to kind of for a moment just ponder over this because we're at an interesting point here before we move on to other films in the future and forget about this for all time as we have a tendency to do when we Mm -hmm. do so many movies how the fuck are they doing this yeah why is it that so there it's a string michael it's just that you and i could recreate this scene right here in the studio you put a fish line in your mouth you put a piece of string in your mouth and then i pretend to tug on it it's a optical illusion and i pretend it hurts magic trick yeah and then occasionally one person covers the other person's mouth. Uh, the movie does add a little blood here and there, sure. but it is probably the least graphic kill yep. of the entire uh, franchise. The franchise doesn't do a lot of cutaway kind of kills, mm-hmm. but uh, I mean, it would be, you know, that's the amount of, of how graphic it is. It's marginally more graphic to an implied cutaway, you know, cut to black and then hear the gunshot type kill. Sure. Yet it hurts us. Why? Why does it do? I how? don't know. I. It's just because. Is it the idea? I is think it it's that they set up the idea. Yeah, really I mean, well? they set. They tell you what it is, and then by not seeing it, you just have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's and the the gag reflex as yeah. you're kind of hearing that you're suffering through that with the characters. It's one of those things where, man, this is a a scene to be pondered for a moment to set aside and to study in the future to figure out. I'm curious, double feature show at gmail.com if the audience had as strong a reaction to this as, yeah. as you and I did. But uh man, the way that's orchestrated, it just seems like cinematic mastery, the the way they've done it. So that got me into full on I'm loving killing mode. I'm in Jason mode uh at this point. I think this is this film has the most fun kills. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's got a kill that's that's elevated and doing something artistic, which I love, but I just love seeing the other kills. For uh, the first time since the beginning of the franchise, you know, I had gotten myself out of that rut of, wow, there's a lot of people suffering and yeah. being tortured and I just feel bad for them. And now I am having a blast. You're I really, am you're loving, bashing people in the sleeping bag. It's just great. Loving it's watching. Child's play stuff. It's great. Racist Chester Bennington kill all of his white power friends. Yeah, you know, you get a 3D mouth explosion. I mean... <laughs> uh, you know what else I love before we, we end off our conversation about this franchise? The feeling that I absolutely love that the Saw movies are so good at is we work so hard to beat the trap. Mm-hmm. We work, I mean, that's the whole scene. You have trap scenes. Um, the, the kind of scene that Bowsman joked in Repo about, you know, having that, the bug needle, whatever scene that he realized he wrote and was just writing Saw into Repo and had mm-hmm. to cut out of that. Uh, I think we talked about that on the repo show. I don't remember. But those are the kind of scenes you write for a movie like Saw. You write little trap scenes, little vignettes almost. And what you do in the scene is you have these characters work hard to beat the trap. And uh, and then you have some kind of resolution at the end. A payoff, they get away, whatever happens, happens. And so, so often in the Saw franchise, I guess every time things don't work out for our characters... We do the work to beat the trap and we are there sweating and bloody and disgusting with these characters and we've made these moral, maybe regrettable choices that'll fuck us up the rest of our lives. We've uh, we've gone as far as, uh, like we once said on the Rocky films, selling out, but then only coming to find that it was for nothing and you yeah. just embarrassed yourself. That's what Saw will do. When you fail one of these traps, you've gone through everything you have and you've scarred yourself forever and then sometimes you have brutal failure you just blow up at the end or you've sacrificed something personally yourself you've given a limb to help another human being Mm -hmm. out 
And at the very last second, they just die anyways. <laughs> and it's just this, oh man, the kind of brutal failure, like the uh, the blindfold plank walking. Mm-hmm. We go through this tedious edge of your seat scene to make our journey all the way across, get to the very end, uh, almost beat the level, and then we fall in the pit at the end. You just go, fuck, really? Really, Saw? And it's just this great moment where Saw fucking smacks you down, and it does it so well. And all the time. (laughs) Well, and the great thing is it does it often enough to go, that's a Saw thing, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't always do that. Right. Because if it always did it, we would know. We wouldn't get invested. Sure. We would go, oh, I don't care. They're just going to die That's going to be, I think, a little bit more in line with the next Killapalooza. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, the fact that you never know what's going to happen at the end, it makes it... Uh, you never know if the trap will work or not. And they keep you guessing. And that's great. After seven films, Saw still surprises. It surprises with its crazy backstory and how dense of a canon it can have, uh, how much is going on at once. And even in the traps, how you never know when you start a trap, really how it's going to end, what you might not expect. Is there a twist on the trap itself, a clue you're not getting? Are all the characters, will no one make it out of the trap? <laughs> Kind of the exciting thing you find in horror movies. Sometimes we end a horror movie in a spot we like where everybody dies and it's a big failure. And uh, and that happens every 10 or 15 minutes in Saw. You have the opportunity for colossal fucking failure. Wow, that was a lot of, that was a lot of Saw. Feel like a champion? I feel a little bit like a champion, but yeah. I don't want to say that out loud. No. Um, Saw is, uh, if we could do a brief recap... Give me a spoiler-free summary, each film, which was what film, so people can keep them in order. All right. Saw is, uh, Saw 1 is stuck in a bathroom. Yes. Saw 2 is party in a house. Starts the Bosman stuff. Saw 3, oh man, that's hard to say without a spoiler. Saw 3 is uh, Angus McFadden, uh, first gauntlet. Okay, yeah, that's true. Saw 4 is Ice Block. Ah, uh, right, yeah. Saw 5 is... Saw 5 starts new director, the right. one-off director. David. And that's Hoffman versus Strom. Yeah, that's true. It's also the box one, yep. is it not? Yeah. Uh, Saw 6 is Health Insurance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'll be an easy way to remember that. And Saw 7 is 3D. Saw 7 is uh, Saw 3D, and maybe the more modern, fun... Uh, action-packed version, it's but almost, strangely the one that pays best tribute Saw to Saw 7 it. is almost as if they had rebooted the franchise right at the end. Yeah, it's kind of got that. It, bring, it You know, it reminds me of that perfect Freddy vs. Jason yep. or Jason Absolutely. 10 where you just get this, hey, thanks for watching all the movies right now. It does it maybe even better than any of those. It may be the best thanks for watching the movies because it happens so quick. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say, now having just uh, just watched all the Saw movies... My favorite things are, you know, production-wise, how we have them every year, how notable that is for doing one really the same week of every year, you know, right around Halloween, on Halloween, Friday before Halloween or whatever, always coming out with one almost anthology style, starting to write in crossovers between the two. I mean, I would really champion the franchise for that. Even if you're not interested in the content of it at all. Right. If you're the kind of person who likes Killapaloozas and the studies of slasher franchises, this really, I mean, Lionsgate, the producers, Juan, everybody seems to have done an incredible job of knowing what a horror franchise or a slasher franchise is. Right. And then bringing all the best pieces together in a modern format, in a format that brings together serialized stuff, has mystery stuff. And this is all totally independent from the content of what actually happens in the films mm-hmm. or any other writing. It's just uh, interesting to say, you know what, let's, it reminds me of, you know, you and I, after doing all of these Saw movies, after doing hundreds of goddamn movies on the show, we still couldn't put together a movie to save our lives. But as we sit here and armchair speculate what our own franchises might be like, yeah, this is something that I think we could be good at, yeah. is the production and going you know what, we're in a modern setting. What if we could, best case scenario, we'll have one every single year, we'll get all the same actors back, we'll rotate around the people who make the film, because that's what you do in a slasher franchise, but we'll have enough crossovers that you never feel like this is a distinct line where it's no longer Camp A, it's now Camp B. And Saw accomplishes all those things and more. Way to go, Saw. Hell yeah. So um, we uh, we have a website. The only website you need this time, honestly, is donate.doublefeatureshow.com. If you could uh, help us out with that server thing, 
we're going to go halfway. We are hoping the audience goes halfway. Um, we're going to say that we got 200 bucks for it and hopefully the audience can sum total together, drum up 200 bucks. And then we can at least eliminate the server, uh-huh. the biggest piece of our constant failing equipment right out of, uh, out of the mix. Donate.doublefutureshow.com. The main website will have the saw page with all the extra goodies, uh-huh. including uh, the MP3 version of this <laughs> uncut episode, I guess. You guys, I mean, if you want uncut episodes, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. <laughs> I think they just sound like crappier versions of the actual episodes, but that's totally fine. It was a way to kill nine hours of your day. Uh, there's also a Facebook page. And um, you can leave us a review on iTunes. We mentioned iTunes a lot as having all the Saw films. So if we didn't spoil them too terribly and you still want to go back and see every one and you didn't do that, go on iTunes and fucking grab the HD version. Yeah. We had a, God, I had such a good day doing these. It was weird for us because we always like to think of double features as midnight things. Yep. But we started Saw with, you know, bagel breakfast yep. in the morning. Had some coffee, David Lynch style, mocha, black coffee, and just... Hey, let's turn on Saw and enjoy the rest of our day. And they're all an hour and a half. God, Saw, so good. What are we doing uh, next time on the all show? Right. Next time, and I need to preface this, we're going to cover more Shawnee Smith. We can't talk about her anymore than no, we have. No, I think Shawnee Smith was amazing. Bravo, Shawnee Smith. So you we're going to do such a good uh, job in here. We're going to do The Blob. We're going to do the 80s version of The Blob. Great, great. And we're going to pair that with uh, Mars Attacks. Perfect. Some invaders from outer space. Watch more fucking film? Bye. Done got pigged.